Very good. Very good. Okay, so tonight, uh, one announcement uh, before we uh, begin, um, and it's uh, it's uh, it's rather a big one. Um, so let me uh, let me just kind of jump straight to it. Uh, many of you guys have heard me talk about this at times in the past before, but I'm very excited because Signum is just about ready to launch. A really big new program. We're doing. We're, we're. 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 This is sort of the first step of the next evolution of Signum University. It's a really, really big thing. Um, and for those of you who think that my uh, metaphor there is <laughs> influenced by my son's Pokemon training, you're probably correct. Um, but anyway, um, uh, there's there's there, there's been a, a basic issue that I've been you know as I've been sort of asking myself you know, you know as I've been thinking about this over the course of the whole last year, essentially, you know, what are the directions in which Signum can, should be going? Where do I think that Signum can do the most good, can have the most impact? Um, where should we focus our energy and attention? This is one of the things, you know, as president of Signum that I think about. Um, and one of the things that I have kept coming back to is the way in which uh, there's this, uh, there's this really weird disconnection between the humanities and the real world, right? Like, uh, what I mean by that is, on the one hand, there's this wide perception that the humanities are, like, maybe abstractly or, like, you know, sort of theoretically important, but, you know, impractical, right? It's, you don't go and get a humanities degree if you want to get a real job, you know, like that that kind of thinking, right? Um, and But then on the other hand, you go and you talk to people in the business world, like to employers and say like, you know, what skills do you value most in your employees? Like, what are the things that you look for more than anything else? And they all say like things like communication skills and, uh, you know, like, I, basically like the kinds of things that you, that, that you, the kind of skills that you develop and train studying the humanities. And this kind of gap, this, this, this just disjunction uh, between the world of like humanities education and the real world, like the the actual world of application out there in, in uh, you know, the, the world of industry and employment. This kind of gap is something that I think we as educators can do a better job of, of bridging, right? And I think that here that there's, um, there's a real role for Signum University and there are several things that we're going to be doing uh, as we're moving to sort of step into this gap because I think we can we can do humanity I don't, when I say me I don't just mean Signum I mean higher education can do humanities better uh, than uh, than humanities have been treated here in the past um, and um, uh, and I think that more than that also we can also benefit a lot of people even not just thinking about like undergraduate students um, but a lot of people who are already out there in the workforce, we can completely, uh, there's, we can help. So the first stage of sort of this, this new growth of Signum University is going to be starting very soon. Um, and um, uh, let me show you what that is uh, going to look like. And I'm talking about the Signum Path program. Signum Path is a professional development program that we're launching very soon. Um, which is uh, enables you to get training in exactly these kinds of foundational skills, uh, which you need to succeed in any single job market, but which you almost never get offered as professional development uh, uh, opportunities. Um, so we're uh, we're running several professional badge programs in things like clicking through here to my next page. Making verbal connections, right? Like how to give presentations, how to uh, to both communicate to, to 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 communicate and, and listen to people better. Uh, how to how to, to 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 make speeches. How to influence people um, uh, through your words, right? Uh, talking about writing, uh, being able to write clearly and accurately, persuasively, how to incorporate storytelling and think about narrative in order to convey your message, thinking about basic things like marketing yourself and time management and uh, uh, information literacy and things like that. These are all things uh, that we can help with. Person-to-person um, -person skills, emotional intelligence, conflict resolution. Um, these are all uh, the kinds of things that we're going to be offering courses in. 
those courses will be launching very soon. So of course, I'll certainly update everybody when our registration is open uh, for these. But I wanted to share that this is happening. We just uh, we just posted our uh, we just created pages on both LinkedIn and Facebook uh, for the Signum Path program. So I certainly invite uh, you guys to go and uh, uh, like those if you can, if you want to sort of share uh, information there from our from either in LinkedIn or in Facebook. Um, you know, we're going to we're just we're just getting started there. We just created those pages within the last few days um so um anyway this is this is these are things that we think are a, a major gap um but again we, we think that we can uh we we can really help people here so i'm really excited to uh uh to get this uh to get this program started uh and to uh and to and to move forward because again these are the things that no matter what work line of work you're in right no matter what you do uh yeah, of course, like the, you know, the, 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 the basic skills that you've learned the you know, wh whatever you do, programming, engineering, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, those are all obviously super useful skills that enable you to get your job, but the kinds of things that are going to really enable you to, to kind of move forward and, and, uh, and, and market yourself better and be able to, uh, you know, maybe move up into management and things like that. This is, this is, this is the kind of stuff that's really going to help folks. Uh, so really excited about this. Um, uh, anyway, so please do spread the word. So the, the, the registration that we're doing, we have a couple different, uh, uh, versions of the PATH program, just to mention this very briefly. Uh, one is we do we are opening the doors to individual enrollment, so we'll just be doing classes. The classes are short; they're just a month long. These are these are these are uh, uh, short time commitments, uh, and uh, we're going to start those as I say very soon. Uh, we'll do a class a month, so you can complete a badge uh, in only three months, um, and. Uh, and, oh yeah, so, so th those will be open to everybody. So everybody can, and anyone can enroll individually. We also do have uh, a, a corporate program. That is, uh, you know, we, we will establish relationships with a company. So if a company would like to bring us in and have a group of people of their employees go through uh, these courses together, um, that's a really cool environment. We've, we, uh, uh, we have a relationship with our, our first company. Again, we're just launching this program, uh, which I'm really excited about. We'd be happy to uh, work out relationships with other companies where we can really customize these courses uh, and really design a program that's going to really fit the needs within that particular company, even orienting the assignments and, and everything to the actual work that's being done uh, within that company. So yeah, so if anyone has... Uh, a company that might be interested in bringing us on board to sort of, you know, help increase efficiency across the board. We can totally do that again for individuals. Uh, if, you know, just for the sake of self-improvement, being able to, uh, to boost your own resume and build your own skills. These are things that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to be, uh, offering to, yeah. Dra Dragon Rider says, even though I'm retired, I would still be interested. Absolutely. See, this is the other thing, right, about the humanities, about the humanities stuff is that this stuff is fun, right? It's fun to do these things, uh, even uh, uh, even even in, you know, when when you're not just thinking about, you know, the application, which is, of course, important and very broad. Um, so anyway, I uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew about this. Uh, this is uh, this is sort of the next big thing from Signum that we're going to be. Uh, it's our first step in this uh, in this wider direction. And we're not leaving aside any. You know, we're not leaving behind anything that we do. Uh, this is sort of filling in around this. Uh, and uh, you know, you'll see. I'm going to be doing. I think I'll probably announce this next week. Uh, soon, within the next couple weeks, I'm going to be doing uh, a State of the University address. I haven't done one since the fall. I think it's time for a spring one, uh, and I want to fill you in on what's happening uh, at Signum now because we are really, as I as I've said, we're really stepping forward into sort of the next era uh, of our growth right now, and it's it's exciting. Uh, it's it's really exciting. And I want to share with you more about sort of the plan and how all this is going to fit together and what this means for the the Signum programs that you've already known and enjoyed and and and, and all of that stuff. So, anyway. Uh, we're, uh, that's some of the things that's, uh, uh, that's doing. Ah, Zach says, uh, hopefully it means, uh, you'll be able to join me as an undergraduate someday soon. It might mean something like that, Zach. That, that is a, that is a, a very real 
<laughs> possibility. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Um, so that is my big announcement for today. A pretty big announcement. I think you, you, uh, you have to agree. So uh, as I say, please do. Um, if you want uh, more information, um, you can just you can email us at path at signumu dot org. So that's uh, um, uh, and there should be a there should be a yeah, there is there's a contact button down here. So you can just click right through from the website, um, and again you can get access to this from our Facebook or LinkedIn pages as well. All right, very good. Let us get back to our text then, and look at that. I haven't crashed or anything. That is so exciting. Okay. Tonight we're going to look, we're going to get back to, I should say, Aragorn's call, Aragorn's um, uh, response, right? His, and this is the longest speech Aragorn's going to make all day long, right? Um, we will not, um, uh, we will not see Aragorn talk again, will we? Does Aragorn say word one for the rest of the day? Like, does he say another word all day long? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think he's done after this. Um, oh, he does talk about Tom Bombadil. Okay. Okay. All right. He is going to say something again. But anyway, in any case, I, I stand by what I'm pretty sure is correct, that this is the longest speech he's going to make uh, over the course of the whole council. Um, so this, this is Aragorn's big moment, right? And the important thing that I would remind us of uh, as we go back into it this is a speech directed at Boromir. This is his response to Boromir's what seemed to be an expression of doubt, what Bilbo certainly interprets as, as uh, uh, a, uh, an expression of doubt or even of suspicion, right? Um, and um, so I want to be thinking about this primarily in this context, because it seems to me very largely for Boromir's benefit uh, that... Aragorn is speaking, right? And so my, but the basic question that I bring to this speech is, what is he communicating exactly? What message does Aragorn have? What is he trying to explain exactly to Boromir? Um, and so we started talking about this last time. I've been, uh, <laughs> of late, I've taken to stopping mid-slide. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, first, uh, before before we do that, I almost forgot about this one. Um, many thanks to Kate Neville for this. Kate was uh, bringing up the question about Bilbo and uh, Aragorn. Well, we were talking about that. Um, so she she did this uh, analysis of it, which I think is really wonderful, and I, want, and I wanted to share with you about Bilbo and Aragorn's relationship. Um, so she went back and she researched the dates because we were talking about that, but I was kind of vague, as I often am. Uh, so she, uh, she supplied some details here. The earliest moment when Bilbo could have met Aragorn was in The Hobbit when 10-year-old Aragorn was living there with his mother. But Aragorn did not then know his true identity. He was Estel, and I don't think anyone in Rivendell would have told the truth about the boy to a hobbit passing through. Aragorn learns his true identity at age 20 in 2951, which is two years after Balin and Gandalf visited Bilbo at the end of The Hobbit. So even if Bilbo had visited Rivendell during those ten years, it is still unlikely, he is still unlikely to have learned who Estel is. Aragorn meets Gandalf when he's 25, 2956, and from age 26 to 49, he's wandering Middle-earth, serving in Rohan and Gondor. Frodo is born in 2968, his parents die in 2980, the same year Aragorn meets Arwen again in Lorien. If we assume that Bilbo adopts Frodo in, in 2980-81, it is unlikely that he would have left Frodo for long trips to Rivendell after the adoption. The farewell feast is 3001, the same year Gandalf opens his heart to Aragorn and the ranger guard on the Shire is doubled. Bilbo settles in Rivendell in 3002, Gilrain, Aragorn's mother, dies in 3007. From 3008 to 3017, Aragorn and Gandalf seriously search for Gollum. Okay? Now, so that's the, those are the dates. Here's Kate's reasoning. So when did Aragorn tell Bilbo his story? The first option 
is that Bilbo visited Rivendell sometime between 2951 and 2956, before young Aragorn goes on his great wandering. So, remember, 51 is when Aragorn finds out who he is, 56 is when he leaves town to go travel the world and be Th uh, Thorongil and everybody else, right? So there's a, uh, there's a six-year window in which, conceivably, theoretically, Aragorn could have told Bilbo uh, about himself if Bilbo met him, right? If Bilbo encountered him then. Aragorn, being new to his true identity, might have told Bilbo his story, but his identity was secret for a reason, and would he have revealed that secret to a visitor, even a respected one? The second option is that Bilbo didn't hear Aragorn's story until he settled in Rivendell. This is after Gandalf opened his heart to Aragorn, who would then have had good reason to establish a relationship with Bilbo. This leaves only six years of regular contact before Aragorn takes up the hunt for Gollum, but that's long enough for mortals to become friends. My headcanon, then, is that Bilbo composed, all that is, composed the All That Is Gold poem after Gilrine died in 3007 to comfort his friend and let him know that he, Bilbo, believed that Aragorn would fulfill his destiny and bring Estelle back to the world. First of all, can I just say, that's a beautiful reading, right? I mean, whether or not I think all the evidence points in that way, I, I like, I love that story. Uh, and I, like, want that story to be true, no matter what the evidence might be. Uh, so I, I, just the first thing I would want to say about Kate's reading there, I think that's absolutely wonderful. Um, it does seem to me uh, very... I do agree with... So one of Kate's premises, right, is that after Bilbo settles down with Frodo he would not have gone to Rivendell. And that, I think, is pretty clear, right? When when Frodo is imagining... Remember at the end of chapter two, when his heart is responding to this idea of leaving the Shire, right, and going off wandering, one of the things that Frodo thinks of is imagining going to see the house of Elrond Half-Elven, right? So I don't think he's been there before. I don't think that Frodo has gone. And even if Bilbo might possibly go to Rivendell after he's taken in Frodo, he's not going to leave Frodo behind, right? I, so I, I, I do agree that Bilbo would only go t to Rivendell. It seems to me very likely that he would only go to Rivendell after the adoption if he had taken Frodo with him, right? And, and I think that's pretty clear that he did not. So I'm uh, ready to agree with Kate that certainly between 2980 and when he finally moves into Rivendell, uh, Bilbo wouldn't have gone, right? And so therefore it's very unlikely that he and Aragorn would have met. Could they possibly have met on the, you know, like in the, in the Shire, right? Or on the outskirts of the Shire during one of Bilbo's rambles? That's conceivable, right? And Tony, yeah, I was thinking about how that lined up with our theory about the two phases of Bilbo's life. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. Um, that that would be the moment, right? The moment of the adoption of Frodo is the moment when he flips that switch, right? And ceases to be Bilbo the wanderer and becomes Bilbo the teacher, right? Bilbo the transmitter of elvish lore uh, to the Shire, right? Uh, and to the younglings of the Shire. And he starts translating Gilgalad poems and teaching them to impressionable, uh, you know, young potato farmer sons, right? Exactly. Um, so anyway, that all seems to me very solid. So it's true based on this and based on the time that we know that Aragorn was unavailable, right, that it does really limit the number of windows. Um, so you, if, if, if you believe that Bilbo uh, learned the truth about uh, Aragorn's history before he moved into Rivendell after the long-expected party... Um, then you have to believe that it was in that window, in that 2951 to 2956 window, that Aragorn shared that. It's not impossible that that happened. It's conceivable that that happened. So long as they met, we have no evidence that they would have met, that is, would have encountered each other during that time. Um, but it's possible. You can't rule it out. The only thing, um, the only thing that really kind of... Um, supports that idea. The only piece of evidence that I can think of which would seem to indicate that that's likelier than the later date is the fact that Bilbo characterizes it in the passage we read last week as a long time ago, right? Uh, he told me that a, a long time ago when he first told me about himself, right? Um, 
the question would be, what does Bilbo consider a long time ago, right? Um, if it was basically 10 years ago, right, at the death of, or, you know, around the death of Gilrun, um, or, you know, soon after Bilbo moved in uh, to Rivendell 17 years ago, would Bilbo consider that a long time ago, right? Would he... Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I yeah, Tony, I'm thinking that too. Seventeen years is kind of a long time, right? I, and also, remember the context in which Bilbo says it, right? Um, yeah, Tessa says maybe it's a long time ago in the context of their friendship. Yeah, exactly. I, I he's not Bilbo. When he makes that comment, he's not like testifying before a jury or something like that, right? He's just, he tosses that off in, 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 in context, you know, providing Frodo with the context of this poem that he just recited, which, remember, he, Bilbo, doesn't have any reason to think Frodo's ever heard before, right? Um, uh, he doesn't know that Frodo heard it in the inn at Bree. Um, so... Yeah, exactly, Marielle. He first told when he first told me about himself is sort of vague, right? We don't know when that was. Um, could Bilbo have characterized, you know, 15, 17 years ago as a long time ago? Yeah, I mean, they've been friends for many years since then, right? Um, and it's not hard to imagine that to Bilbo, it, it feels like he's known Aragorn for a long time. Um, I mean, goodness. It seems there are certainly moments here, uh, and we'll see in the next chapter as well, in which Frodo feels like he's known Aragorn for a long time, right? I mean, remember, he's even saying things like, I mean, he's dear to me, right, to Gandalf uh, in the previous chapter. So um, anyway, I, I, uh, um, I don't think that... Uh, the fact that it was only 17, it would only be, you know, 17 years or less, uh, means that it doesn't, it necessarily doesn't fit with the idea of it being, uh, uh, of it being quote, a long time ago. Um, but, um, I get it, Mike. Mike says, you'll never convince me they haven't been best buds for 77 years. Hey, like, c can't rule it out. I mean, we can't rule it out. Um, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I have a little bit of a hard time thinking that the impression that Bilbo made when he passed through Rivendell in The Hobbit um, was so great that he and, you know, Aragorn have been constant pen pals ever since. Uh, there's a lot of gaps of time in there uh, in which they could not possibly have had any contact with each other. But, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway... I'm. I'm not if you know. So like. So so Mike, if your own head canon is that they've been best buds for 77 years, I'm not gonna. You know that <laughs> I'm not gonna convince you, and I don't think Kate's gonna convince you. But um, um, but I really uh, um, I really like this. Yeah, Tessa. I was gonna say that too. Uh, Tessa is asking. Do I think Tolkien calculated the years and noticed that Aragorn was there at the time? Did he himself consider what might have happened? Oh yeah, sure. No, Tessa, do I think that. Tolkien was well aware of the potential overlap. Oh, yeah. I mean, when he's making up the tale of years, uh, Tolkien would certainly have been conscious of when the events of The Hobbit fell, right? And so if he it, it, he, it would not be lost on him that Aragorn would already be living at Rivendell at that time. So there's no question about that. The thing I was going to... Um, um, uh, the thing I was going to add, though, is that... Let's not forget that we are, there's a question of chronology here, not internal chronology, but external chronology as well. There's not only, to, you know, when we're thinking about trying to understand these lines, um, it not only needs to be fit within the internal chronology of Middle Earth as represented in the published text, but also the external chronology of Tolkien's life and the development of the story, right? Um, when Bilbo says that to Frodo a long time ago, when he tosses off the long time ago phrase, uh, Tolkien had not yet constructed the timeline which, um, 
which Kate was just laying out for us, which is derived primarily from Appendix B, which was written after everything else was written. So remember, the dates themselves are retcon, right? The dates themselves are Tolkien kind of working out and backfitting the story um, to what concepts emerged as the story came along. Right. Some of that stuff he does along the way. There, there are many of the things, you know, getting the timeline in order is something that he really sort of focused on. But the sort of expanded timeline to look at the whole scope of the dates and and kind of step back from it and fill out the entire, um, um, uh, you know, the entire the entire thing along the way. Um, that's I mean, that that's that was a, an ongoing process. And a lot of that was done later on. So. Uh, so to some, when we're thinking about the external dates and not just the internal dates, uh, in some ways we kind of do this backwards, right? You know, that is we're taking, um, we're going back to the calendar in, you know, we're going back to the, to the tale of years, to Appendix B, to try to explain why Bilbo would say it was a long time ago, right? When in fact... In Tolkien's actual creative process, Bilbo first says it was a long time ago, and then Tolkien builds the chronology around that. Right, so it's it's um, uh, like which direction the evidence goes is in some ways kind of uh, kind of kind of flipped, right? In some ways, so it's just just something else to uh, to keep in mind. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tony, I agree. I also have always thought it was ironic that there's a 17-year gap between Frodo getting the ring and leaving it, that sort of gap of time in the beginning of the, of the, the, the Lord of the Rings, uh, and that there was also a 17-year gap between uh, the publication of The Hobbit and the publication of The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, that is uh, a bit ironic uh, in that way. Um Oh, that's, it's ironic, Angris. It's not intentional. The 17-year gap in real time was not his plan, uh, and he certainly didn't map it to uh, match uh, the other. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, no, I don't think he was modeling that. Apart from the fact that the dates don't work, that is, you know, the dates in the text were there prior to when that worked out. Um Apart from that, the last bunch of years in there, that is in the 17 year process of the gap, like those, the last few years before the publication of The Lord of the Rings, you know, from like 49 to 54, really, around in there. Um, uh, <laughs> that was not a pleasant process. Uh, the whole process of getting the Lord of the Rings published uh, was very stressful and near to despair at times. I can't imagine him going back and like wanting to solemnize that within his story, right? That's I don't think uh, he would do that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he modeled his life after the Lord of the Rings instead, JJ. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No. That. That's. That's. That's the direction it works. And Brunier is suggesting it'll take us 17 years to finish the Lord of the Rings. Um, hey, <laughs> we should be so lucky. <laughs> yeah, we should be so lucky. Oh, and I wanted to uh, say uh, uh, welcome to um, uh, who is it? Uh, uh, Freya Drew. Fre Fre I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Um, uh, Freyadrew, who just caught up and is joining us live for the first time. Uh, congratulations. Welcome. Um, oh, right. Cosmic93 suggests it'll actually take 17 valiant years. So that's that's different. That's, that's yeah, very good. Very good. Uh, 17 valiant years means 170 <laughs> years of the sun. Uh, so, well, roughly. Uh, math is more complicated than that, it turns out. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway. All right. Um... So anyway, thank you, Kate. That was really that was really wonderful. Uh, and as I said, I love that that you know the 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 kind of the spirit in which his thinking of you know the, the analysis we were doing last week, the way that the poem comes across in this new context, and uh, you know when I ask myself the question, what you know, given what Bilbo says here in the context in which he pulls it out, right? The the poem there. What does this suggest about what Bilbo was? conveying at the time that he wrote the poem, all that discussion we had last week, 
um, I think it, it's a it's a it fits just gorgeously, right? Thinking of that moment, which would have been a difficult moment for Aragorn, right? Not just because he lost his mom, right? But the way in which it ties in with the whole Estelle story uh, and thing, I I love that. I love that. Um, hey, great! Turin's Bane uh, is joining us live from Brazil for the first time. Excellent, wonderful! Congratulations! I will always admire the people who manage to catch up uh, with us here. Uh, very good. Okay, so uh, let's get back to the text. So we're back to Aragorn's response. Um, let's. Uh, I'll read the whole slide again. We talked about the first two paragraphs, uh, and then I want to focus on the on the third one. Um, again, I want to um, uh, remember my basic question that I want to focus on is, what is Aragorn communicating in general, but especially to Boromir in particular? I made that up myself, he whispered to Frodo, for the Dunedain, a long time ago when he first told me about himself. I almost wish that my adventures were not over and that I could go with him when his day comes. Aragorn smiled at him. Then he turned to Boromir again. For my part, I forgive your doubt, he said. Little do I resemble the figures of Elendil and Isildur as they stand carven in their majesty in the halls of Denethor. I am but the heir of Isildur, not Isildur himself. I have had a hard life and a long, and the leagues that lie between here and Gondor are a small part in the count of my journeys. I have crossed many mountains and many rivers, and trodden many plains, even into the far countries of Rune and Harad, where the stars are strange. But my home, such as I have, is in the north, for here the heirs of Elandil have ever dwelt in long line unbroken from father unto son for many generations. Our days have darkened, and we have dwindled, but ever the sword has passed to a new keeper. And this I will say to you, Boromir, ere I end. Lonely men are we, rangers of the wild, hunters, but hunters ever of the servants of the enemy, for they are found in many places, not in Mordor only. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we were emphasizing, of course, about his description of the length of his journeys, right, is that again, to, you know, as, as uh, a couple of you were saying last week, um, you know, if he looks travel worn, uh, it's because he is travel worn, right, that he's sort of emphasizing, you know, I look like I do because of what I've been in, what I've where I where I've where I've gone and what I've seen, right? Um, I'm especially interested in his choice of Rune and Harad, right? Um, emphasizing the wider context, not just bragging about the extent of his journeys, right? I have gone way further. Like I have been think of your 110 day journey, Boromir, and then imagine going another 110 days in the opposite direction, right? That's where I've been and among some of my, uh, of my journeys. Um, but, uh, but again, there's more than this. There's more than just the bragging about this, the way that he's recontextualizing, right? Boromir, you're focused on Gondor. You're concerned about Gondor and Gondor's situation. I, I get it. I get it better than you do. I've been to Rune. I've been to Harad. I have seen these lands that surround and are now besieging Gondor, right? I understand the implications of their attack and of their armies better than you possibly could. I've seen them myself with my own eyes, right? I've been to Denethor's throne room. And I'm, so he could have he could have name dropped other things, right? He's probably been to other places that are also pretty far away and might even sound more exotic to Boromir, right? I mean, he could be talking about like Enidwyth and stuff like that, right? Which he doubtless knows better than Boromir does. Um, he could be talking about the extreme, you know, up towards Angmar or something like that. I bet Aragorn's been in that direction too, right? But he doesn't talk about that because again, that's not, he's not just bragging. He's not just trying to, um, uh, talk himself up. He's communicating thing to Boromir, right? Specifically. Um, so let's focus now on that third paragraph. What are some of the things that he is emphasizing in that third paragraph? Uh, that third paragraph. Uh, let's see, Karita, you were saying, I wonder what, uh, that such as I have means about home. Um, I agree, that's a really striking thing. If he had just said, but my home is in the north, right, um, he would have been 
differentiating himself from Boromir in one way, right? I know Gondor, man, right? I know Gondor and its circumstances and its, like, larger political situation better than you do, right? But, but, um, but my home is in the north, right? I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to say I'm, I'm from Gondor, right? I'm not trying to say that, like, you know, Boromir did his whole verily from the land of Gondor I am come. I'm not just me tooing to that, right? I'm not Gondorian. My home is in the north. But of course, Kareda, as you point out, he doesn't just say, but my home is in the north. He says, but my home, such as I have, is in the north, right? Um, he doesn't have a real home. My home, such as I have, is in the north, right? Uh, I mean, it's possible to imagine Elrond kind of looking around and being like, what are we, chopped liver here, right? Like, what are you suggesting about my establishment here? You know, uh, <laughs> such as I have, right? Um, uh, but um, clearly he's not uh, intending to affront or insult the hospitality of his future father-in-law. Um, the point is that it's not really his home, right? Um, exactly, JJ says, Elrond's house is just his home away from home. Exactly, exactly. Um, and yes, Cosmic 93, I agree. It's, it's not just about him not having a, a house, right? Uh, it's that he doesn't have, like, an identity, right? He doesn't have, he doesn't have a place. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Cecilia was saying at first, I thought this would almost be an insult to Elrond. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, exactly. He's, uh, Cecilia, he, just as you suggest, he's not, he, he's not claiming Rivendell as his home because his, like his, his work takes him elsewhere. His home is to be on the road, right? Uh, to sort of, to do his, uh, to do his job. Um, yes. And Tony, he is identifying with Arnor, which no longer exists. Absolutely, absolutely, um, uh, and yes, Veronica, you're right. There, the 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 Dunedain of the North are exiles from their land. They are in a. It's not exactly like a diaspora kind of situation, but it's it's like it in some ways. Um, the reason I say it's not like it's just because there aren't there are very few of them left, right? So it's not uh, it's not like a large people that has now been dispersed uh, among many kingdoms. Um, it's not exactly that same dynamic, but it's, but it's like it. It's like it. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. As Matt says, the Dunedain don't lay claim to the Northern Kingdom, even if they live there. Um, exactly. So one of the things, one of the, one of the simple observations, therefore, that we can make about that statement is that he is, he is, I said that even if he said, but my home is in the North, he would have been making a distinction between himself and Boromir, right? Having just said, I know Gondor. Right? I, under, I get it. You're worried that people up here aren't going to appreciate the situation and the importance of the situation down in Gondor Boromir. Right? I get it. I totally get it. I know it. I've been there. I've seen the throne room. Right? I've been in Gondor. I've been in Rune and Harad. I get it. Right? The first thing he does is then is establish that difference. But it's, but it's, it's a double difference. Right? Not only am I not Gondorian, not only do I not have the same home as you, right? I, I don't have any home. Uh, you have Gondor, right? You're from Gondor. You have Gondor. I, I, I don't, I don't have any home, right? Um, for here the heirs of Elondil have ever dwelt in long line unbroken from father unto son for many generations. Here. Where? In the north. Vaguely, the north, right? My home such as I have is in the north. The north is my home. The north is my identity, right? I am the heir of Isildur. I am the last in the line of Elendil of the Arnorian kings in the north. My identity is connected with the kingdom of Arnor. It's not really my home, right? Because I don't have a home. I don't have a kingdom. I don't have a city. I don't have a house, right? Um, but I identify up here because here the heirs of Elendil have ever dwelt in long line unbroken from father unto son for many generations, right? 
Um, and yes, Argent, he does carefully mention unbroken here. And here's one of the other things that I would, um, that I would say. I remember somebody, I can't, I can't remember whether it was in this discussion or whether it was maybe on Twitter. Somebody was basically saying, look, Aragorn's claim to the kingship is really actually very weak, right? I mean, okay, yes, he's a lineal descendant of Isildur, fine. But you know, basically the argument was, if somebody showed up uh, who could prove, you know, that he was the lineal descendant of, you know, uh, I don't know who, like one of the Egyptian pharaohs or something like that, right? And like showed up in Cairo and was like, hi, like I'm like a lineal descendant of the pharaohs, like um, let me take over, right? No one would care, right? I mean, it's like basically the the mere fact of genealogical descent has now passed into irrelevance, right? Um, it's one thing to say, hey, turns out this guy is the descendant of Isildur, and it's another thing to say, and therefore he should be king, right? One of the things that I think Aragorn is emphasizing here, um, notice the we's that he starts using here. Here the heirs of Elando have ever dwelt in long line unbroken from father unto son for many generations, right? Our days have darkened, and we have dwindled, but ever the sword has passed to a new keeper. Yeah, okay, so I didn't crash. That's a good thing. Um, okay, anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the heirs of Velando know what they're doing, right? This is not like we dredged up somebody who happens to have the right genetic profile, right? Um, it's, it's more than that, right? It's much more than that. Um, it is that, um, they, this tradition has been alive, right? There's a we involved, right? We are, like, the heirs of Elandil have been waiting. They have been here in a long line unbroken. And the unbrokenness seems to me to emphasize not just, you know, uh, generational descent. I mean, yes, that, of course. But I think he's saying something more than that. I, I, Elrond already established that. Elrond already said that he was the unbroken descendant, right, of Elendil and Isildur. Aragorn doesn't need to prove that. He doesn't need to assert that anymore. I think when he's talking about long line unbroken from father unto son. Notice how in the next sentence he's talking about the sword passing to a new keeper generation by generation, right? Um, the knowledge of who we are and what that means, right? The sword of Elendil, this broken sword, which you were sent to seek, right? Has been cherished and passed down from generation to generation as we have always remembered who we are and what we might get called to do. Thinking back now to the conversation we had about the broken sword, right? And the answer that Aragorn gave to the question, why should I seek a broken sword, right? Um, if his role, if his job is to take up the mantle of Elendil, not as ruler, right, but as leader, war leader, and hero to challenge the might of the Dark Lord, right? If that is going to be Aragorn's role as heir of Velondil, he is emphasizing we've been preparing for this for literally thousands of years. This is what we've been waiting for. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. The lore and the heirlooms have passed along with the lineage. It's about identity, not about family, Tony. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, good, good. Um, interesting, yeah. So Matt says, an interesting association. Those without a home include Aragorn, Bilbo, Frodo, and Gandalf, all of whom have as their primary jobs making sure the homes of others are safe or found. It is a claim that Boromir is making about Gondor. Aragorn may be pointing out that the next step of those who take up this task uh, leave home behind, is to leave home behind, and that he, Boromir, may have to make that choice. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, 
is there a kind of I don't want to say challenge because I don't mean that as a you know that he's like uh, uh, sort of being harsh with Boromir here, but you know, are you willing to do this? And Matt, I would add, yeah, Boromir taking this journey upon himself, as he admitted that he did, I think does show that Boromir is willing to do it. I mean, he was the war leader, right? He left his position as Captain General of the Armies of Gondor in order to go on this quest. So you could say, Matt, that he has done that already. He's given up his home, right, in order to come on this long and, as far as he knows, hopeless journey, right, which is still the one last desperate hope that they can that they and Gondor can see of maybe bringing what aid whatever aid the dream might have been pointing to, right? As it seems like their only hope, because again, they know they're not going to be able to defeat uh, the Witch King. They tasted that, right? At the crossing of the river and at the, at the loss of, his, of, 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 of Athelion. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I, I think that's a good way to, uh, to, to thinking about it. Yes. And Tony, you're right. It's more about defeating, Sauron than it is about becoming king. It's something that we've been emphasizing. Uh, that I, I feel this is, to me, if I had to list one of the primary things I've learned in our last five or six classes, it would be that. I would have said, I probably did say earlier on, that one of the major issues here is revealing the claimant to the throne, right? Um, and Aragorn kind of placing himself as, you know, like the the reveal of the returning king and his plan to come back to Gondor, right? Um, but the more we, uh, the more we talk about this, right, the less that seems to me the genuine emphasis of the text, right? Aragorn certainly um, is not, has not really said anything that suggests his thought is, "I'm coming back for the for for the crown." Right, I'm coming back to claim the throne. Um, that's not what he's coming back for. He's coming back to oppose Sauron, Tony, just as you say, um, uh, like Elendil did. That's how he's paralleling himself to Elendil, not his right to rule. Um, uh, politics is the last thing that Aragorn seems interested in right now. Um, uh, yeah. Mad Violinist says, are we seeing a difference in agenda between Elrond and Aragorn? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know if I'd say difference in agenda, Mad Violinist, but I think perhaps difference in motivation, right? Elrond was being very politic, as we said, but I think that it seems that Elrond's gentle emphasis was to convey to Boromir the significance of who Aragorn was, right? To invite him to think of Aragorn in the context of Gondorian history, right? Thinking back to um, uh, uh, Minas Ithil, right? And uh, uh, Isildur and Elendil. Um, Aragorn, so where Aragorn seems to be focused so far from what we've seen so far, his message seems to be, I'm with you, man. Right. Like I, 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 I get it. I get, you don't even have to explain the Gondorian situation. I understand. Right. And this is the tradition that I come from. Right. The sword is passed to a new, I am the keeper of the sword. That was, I'm the keeper of a Lindil sword. And my destiny is to have that sword reforged and to take up the sword of Elendil and to, to, to as best I can, follow in the footsteps of Elendil. That is, the footsteps of Elendil's journey that ended on Mount Doom and in Elendil's own self-sacrificial death, right? That is Aragorn's emphasis and what he, so far, what he seems to be primarily emphasizing, as far as I can see, to Boromir. That uh, Tessa... Elrond might have a slight difference in priorities, right? That he also is sort of perhaps thinking maybe we should also emphasize the, because we don't want politics to get in the way, right? Of that project. Um, so Aragorn is willing to say, for my part, I forgive your doubt, right? Let's not worry about that. Um, Elrond may be wanting to foreground that a little bit. Um, uh, 
Right. Now, uh, Evil Dr. Cannon says, yet Aragorn has to be thinking that the kingship is involved in all this. His marriage depends on it. Well, yeah. But again, the kingship, yes, it, the, the kingship may be associated with his marriage to Arwen, but both of those things together, I, are, which are clearly a package deal, are both associated with the positive resolution of the whole Sauron situation. It is only after the darkness has been defeated that either one of those things, of course, both of those things, as they're int- intimately tied together in his mind, the uh, the kingship, the ascension to the kingship, uh, and the, the wedding to Aragorn, um, both of them are contingent upon the defeat of Sauron, which he doesn't know if a, I mean, there's no reason to think that that will necessarily be accomplished, or B, that he'll survive it if it is C, above concerning Elendil and the broken sword, right? Um, so, is he thinking about it? Is it on his mind? Is it, sure, yeah, again, but again, that's not that's 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 the reward for accomplishing the goal. It's not the goal. You see, see, you see that difference that I'm trying to, to make there? If it were all about, if for Aragorn it were really all about either A, it, it, if it were all about the kingship, then his focus would be on politics, right? And that's what he would be primarily interested in. That's not what he's primarily interested in. He's primarily interested in Sauron and waging the war against the enemy. Right. If his primary interest were the girl, right, and getting the girl, then where would his priorities be? Right. Um, he'd be thinking about the. It, uh, it'd be hard to resist the possibility that you know maybe uh, that uh, you know they could. Uh, he could find a way to be with the girl without defeating Sauron in advance. I don't know, but again, like it's it's those aren't his ends, right? Those are those are the good things that will come should in ways unknown and unforeseeable to him now, should those ends come about, right? Um, exactly, Tony, they could elope, right? Absolutely, <laughs> like, you know, plans for, like, he'd be out, he'd be out constructing a ladder, right? If, uh, if it were really all about, uh, if it were really all, all about the girl. Um, uh, yeah, exactly, Zach, a nice wedding in Far Harad. I hear it's beautiful this time of year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this guy's done a lot of advanced scouting, right? Exactly. Bad Violetta says, or she'd be growing her hair. Absolutely. Yes, that's it. That's exactly it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Torrens Bane says, what other path to kingship would there have been for Aragorn other than the current situation? Well, none. None. I mean, could he show up and just claim the kingship? Could he have done that? You know, 50 years ago? Sure, he could have, right? Any of them could have. Any of the chieftain of the Dúnedain could have. Since Aarnor's death, remember they they, they did, right? Arvedui did, um, uh, after the the you know the, the the death of a couple kings back, right? So when Aarnil takes over as king, Arvedui claims the throne, right? But then the fall, the Arnor's fall happens. Arvedui like is true to his name, which is last king. And then, uh, and then of course, Aarnor goes, but there have been chieftains of the Dúnedain ever since, right? So there's a whole line of chieftains who at any time, while the Gondorians are all like, okay, we have no king. We're waiting for the king to return at any point in the last thousand years, they could have gone down and claimed the throne, but they didn't because the time was not yet. That's the same reason why Aragorn hasn't because the time is not yet. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, Good. Uh, let's see. What was I going to say? Um, all right. I was going to keep going. That's what I was going to do. Our days have darkened and we have dwindled, but ever the sword has passed to a new keeper. Notice the difference in emphasis. Dwindled. Oh, man. Like, Boromir wouldn't admit that if you had him on the rack, right? You know, remember, he objects to the idea of the dwindling uh, you know, the, the, dwindle, the dwindling of Gondor, right? And here's Aragorn saying, um, we have dwindled, right? But ever the sword has passed to a new keeper. His narrative, the narrative of the North, is a totally different narrative than the narrative of Gondor, right? The story of Gondor is the last remnant of the great kingdom that was, right? And it's faded and it's declined, right? But Boromir doesn't want to think about it like that. He likes to keep alive the idea of the glory of Gondor that was, right? And that some version of that is still retained 
uh, in the Gondor that is, right? Aragorn absolutely um, emphasizes the dwindling, right? Our days have darkened and we have dwindled. The story of the North is not the glory is kept alive, even if in small at a smaller scale than the old glory, right? Um, you know, uh, Gondor now with seventy five percent less glory. Like that's not the story of the North, right? The story of Arnor, by contrast, is out of the ashes a fire shall be woken, a light from the shadows shall spring, right? Um, that is the narrative of the North. This home, such as I have, right? This home that isn't really a home. Um, this darkness that has spread over. The point is, we have survived. We remain, right? And ever we have awaited the time, right? Ever the sword has passed to a new keeper, right? As we have been holding alive these traditions, as we have been waiting for the moment. What moment? The moment to take up the sword, Elendil's sword. The moment to fight Sauron and oppose Sauron like Elendil did. Lonely men are we, rangers of the wild, hunters, but hunters ever of the servants of the enemy, for they are found in many places, not in Mordor only. Um, so, lonely men are we, rangers of the north, hunters. We talked about this a long time ago in Bree when the word ranger was first introduced, right? And I was emphasizing that we have to remember not to... Lo- the word ranger, since this publication of this text, right? The word ranger has been normalized, right? We have totally lost the sense that the word ranger has in this text, right? Um, the word ranger is used with scorn. It is a slight. It is a slur, even. That's how it's used in Bree. Um, as a slur, right? Not as a category. I mean, even just the way in which Ranger has been adopted as like a Dungeons and Dragons character class, for instance, you know, uh, exactly, Zach. It doesn't mean generic archer explorer, right? Uh, the way in which Dungeons and Dragons and other, you know, systems and stories and things have taken this idea of Ranger modeled on Aragorn, right? And, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, sort of heroicized the entire concept of, right? You know, so when he, so that's how I always heard it, right? That's how I always heard it when uh, this, this, this sentence, when Aragorn says, lonely men are we, Rangers of the wild, right? It's like he's giving his job title, Right. You know, like like he's flashing his business card. Hi, I'm Aragorn, Ranger of the Wild. Right, that's my that's my job description. Um, exactly, Mariel. That's a really good one. Um, uh, Vagabonds of the road. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, that would be a good a good gloss, a good paraphrase of that. Rangers of the wild, vagabonds of the road. Yeah, um, he's not giving a title that he's proud of and that everybody accepts and respects, right? Lonely men are we, rangers of the wild, hunters, right? That's all we are. We're hunters. Uh, you know, we're hunters off in the woods. We, we are um, rangers of the wild. Um, and, uh, yeah, I see, um, uh, I see several people thinking of the parallel with gypsies. Um, yes, I know that Many people are offended by that word, but that's actually, I think, the right spirit. Like, yes, like it's an offense. Like, again, the way that the word ranger is used, it's meant as an insult. It's meant as a slur, as I said. Um, So um, I, 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 yeah, Um, exactly. Rangers, that's their condition, not their job description. Absolutely. 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 yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Um, interesting. Tiber says, Rangers as military elite, like army rangers uh, in the American army, go uh, back at least to the French and Indian War. Yes. In America, uh, which is different, um, but um, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but, but still, again, what I'm focusing on here is the context within the story, right? Um, what is clear from the internal evidence, especially the evidence in Bree, as we saw it. But again, I think in this usage, he's doing the same thing. He is deliberately using that very slighting term that is used of them, right? Um, emphasizing it because he's emphasizing how lonely they are, how they are dismissed by everybody, dismissed and overlooked by everybody. The only thing that people know about them is that they're hunters, right? And he's like, yeah, we're hunters, right? But hunters ever of the servants of the enemy, right? Yes, we're vagabonds. We don't have a home. Right? We don't have a city. We don't have a house. Right? We wander around in the wild uh, and we hunt. Right? But, and it's like after the dash, he's sort of revealing that, like, this is how we're perceived. And it's pretty much true. Right? Um, but exactly, Argent, the but is a huge turning point. Right? That's when he says, but here's the reality. Right? That's all true. We have no home. We have no kingdom. But we have waited ever, right? Ever the sword has passed to a new keeper, right? Why? Who are we? What are we? What do we do? How do we define ourselves? We rangers of the north, right? Hunters ever of the servants of the enemy, for they are found in many places, not in Mordor only. We have not just survived, right? We have never given up the fight against Mordor. We have never given up the fight against Sauron, right? Um, exactly. We define ourselves not by who we are, but by what we do, Ray, uh, uh, Rayburns. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Let's take this straight into the next paragraph, radical as that sounds. If Gondor, Boromir, has been a stalwart tower, we have played another part. Many evil things there are that your strong walls and bright swords do not stay. You know little of the lands beyond your bounds. Peace and freedom, do you say? The North would have known them little but for us. Fear would have destroyed them. But when dark things come from the houseless hills or creep from sunless woods, they fly from us. What roads would any dare to tread? What safety would there be in quiet lands, or in the homes of simple men at night, if the Dunedain were asleep, or were all gone into the grave? And yet less thanks have we than you. Travelers scowl at us, and countrymen give us scornful names. Strider, I am, to one fat man who lives within a day's march of foes that would freeze his heart, or lay his little town in ruin if he were not guarded ceaselessly. Yet we would not have it be otherwise. If simple folk are free from care and fear, simple they will be, and we must be secret to keep them so. That has been the task of my kindred, while the years have lengthened and the grass has grown. But now the world is changing once again. A new hour comes. Isildur's bane is found. Battle is at hand. The sword shall be reforged. I will come to Minas Tirith. Oh, man. Doesn't that last paragraph give you chills? Whoo! Holy cow. Okay, um, but let's go back to the build-up. First of all, notice how the syntax changes, right? Tolkien is so good at this. Um, notice how he shifts the, the, the paragraphs. Uh, his sentence structure, very compound and complex, right? If Gondor, Boromir has been a stalwart tower, we have played another part. Um, I... But when the dark things come from the houseless hills or creep from, creep from sunless woods, they fly from us, right? That's the way he's... And then notice in that last paragraph, all simple sentences, right? Now the world is changing once again. A new hour comes. Isildur's bane is found. Battle is at hand. The sword shall be reforged. I will come to Minas Tirith. So good. So good. Um... Back to his deliberate invocation of uh, Boromir there in that first paragraph. If Gondor, Boromir, has been a stalwart tower, we have played another part. Now, notice, um, on the one hand, he is explicitly drawing attention to what we have been 
seeing all along, right? We've been talking about all along, and that is Boromir's provincialism, right? Boromir knows very little outside of Gondor, and so and he is explicitly drawing attention to that, right? You know little of the lands beyond your bounds, right? You you your picture of Gondor's role in the larger world is a romanticized one, Boromir, right? Now, notice he's not saying you're completely delusional, right? You know, he, he says, if Gondor has been a stalwart tower, we have played another part. Notice he's not questioning that Gondor has, in fact, been a stalwart tower. It has been, right? Yes. If that is, I mean, the premise of his statement is uh, the assumption that that's true, right? If that is true, then we have been doing something else, right? We have played a different role. Um, we acknowledge the stalwartness of the Tower of Gondor, right? But there has been another part to play. Um, uh, so, yeah, exactly. He is acknowledging Gondor and Boromir's bravery. He's not diminishing that, but he is saying that is such a small part of the whole story. Right. Boromir imagines he said as much. Right. That they are the uh, they are the bulwark of the West. Gondor is right. They are the bulwark of the West. They are the wall that keeps the enemy at bay. And if it were not for their vigilance, the whole rest West would already have been overrun by evil. Right. By the by the tides of the servants of Sauron and Aragorn. Again, he doesn't say you're wrong, Boromir. Right? You're ineffective. He's not. He's not criticizing. What he, what he is saying is, it's not that simple, man. Um, it's just not that simple. There are plenty of things that are not held back by the bulwark of Gondor. The enemy is more. It's yes. You're very near to Mordor. Right? You can see it from Gondor. Yes, you can see the eruptions in Mount Doom sometimes, right? Yes, you can travel in Athelion right next to the enemy's mountains. Um, yes, you could go up and see the Black Gate if you had a mind, right? But that's not Sauron's only game, right? The enemy, the shadow, is at work across the continent, man. Right? It's not just that. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, so again, he's not again he's not diminishing. I think anything that Boromir is doing, he's just explicitly inviting Boromir to imagine a broader context. Many evil things there are that your strong walls and bright swords do not stay. Right, things you don't have the power to hold back. Peace and freedom, do you say? The North would have known them little. But for us, fear would have destroyed them. Not armies and the tides of war. Fear would have destroyed them. Um, when dark things come from the houseless hills or creep from sunless woods, they fly from us. What's he talking about? Can we understand those specific references at all? The second one seems relatively clear, right? Sunless woods? Know any sunless woods? <laughs> You're roving threats, Bruin here. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Something like that. Um, uh, the most sunless wood I know of, yeah, Mirkwood. Mirkwood fits the bill, right? A sunless wood? Um... And of course, it's that would be particularly apropos, right? Considering that Sauron had his home base there for a long time. Again, talk about Boromir's provincialism, right? Yeah, no, like, yeah, you've been the bulwark against Mordor, but dude, the enemy wasn't even in Mordor for the... I mean, yeah, Boromir, you're not only provincial, you're also young, right? Um, but... Like, I can remember the days before Sauron moved back into Mordor, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah, uh, good, exactly. I'm thinking the same thing as you guys. I'm thinking Mirkwood for Sunless Woods, and I'm thinking Barrow Downs for Houseless Hills. Yeah, yeah, uh, Hills, 
specifically, there's one set of hills that we have met. And I think it's fairly obvious that he's thinking of, you know, it's possible that he could be thinking of the troll shaws, Tony, that's conceivable. Um, but considering that he is in the very next paragraph going to say he, uh, that he knows one fat man who lives within a day's march of foes that would freeze his heart. Um, we've seen that, right? Frodo himself traveled less than a day from foes, which would certainly freeze uh, uh, Butterbur's heart uh, till he gets to the Prancing Pony, right? I mean, it's less than a day's journey, right? So um, I think it's, it's m- might there be, um, uh, might there be other issues, right, that he's thinking of? Might there be other dangers from which he protects Bree? Possibly, possibly, but um, uh but again, I, I, I think it seems to me very likely that when he says um, what when dark things come from the houseless hills, he may well be thinking of the Barrow of Downs. That's certainly the, the best example of houseless hills that we have seen. Right um, now, Veronica, that's exactly the next question. Uh, uh, do Barrow Whites leave the Barrows? Apparently not, because the Dunedain prevent them doing so. Um I, I, I agree. I don't know that necessarily there, but I wonder. Here's one of the reasons I wonder about that. First of all, we have several examples, several semi-canonical examples, or let me say this a different way. Um, there is, There are at least two pieces of evidence that Tolkien's initial imagined conception of the Barrow Whites did involve them wandering around. Um... And those two pieces of evidence are a uh, the original um, uh, the original Tom Bombadil poem, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, uh, when in the Adventures of Tom Bombadil, uh, the Barrow White comes to his house. Uh, in fact, there, like, there is an attempted home invasion by the Barrow White, um, and then Tom sort of shoes him away, uh, and he comes back. So that's one thing. Um, is that again? It's and that's that's an old conception, right? And, and you know things have progressed past that. But again, it shows that uh, Tolkien's initial idea of what a Barrow White was included it possibly wandering around and trying to invade your house, like it might go the other direction and try to invade Tom Bombadil or uh, uh, sorry Butterbur's house, right? And yes, exactly what Veronica and Tony are saying is the other piece of evidence that originally the Nazgul were Barrow Whites in the early drafts. Uh, of the Fellowship of the Ring, that he identified, Tolkien identified the two, um, that the Barrow Whites and, uh, and the Ring Wraiths were the same, in fact. So yeah, they were wandering around and invading the Shire. Um, now again, by the time we get to the final version of the story, both of those things are now in the past, right? And his concepts have evolved past that. But again, what I'm saying is, I think it's quite possible to, you know, if we kind of come back to it the other way and say, well, but we know for sure that Barrow Whites wouldn't leave their barrows, I would say, how can you be so sure, right? Uh, I, you know, we have some evidence that the fundamental Barrow White concept does not at all preclude that. Um, that doesn't prove that the Barrow Whites, the kind of Barrow Whites that they made, you know, once the concept has developed to its final state there in the published text, that that means um, they definitely do wonder but I don't think we can prove that they don't. Uh, so, um, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, good. Uh, let's see. Um, interesting. Matt says the statement does give Aragorn a reason to be hanging around and seeing Frodo and company say goodbye to Tom Bombadil. Yeah, he's on border watch at the Barrow Downs that day to make sure that no unquiet dead are shambling their way towards Bree. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is like a regular shift, apparently, uh, for uh, for the Dunedain, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Good. Tony also is remembering the bogey stories that Fatty Bulger heard about goblins and wolves in the old forest. And yeah, several people are, are referring to the possibility of wolves and goblins uh, as uh, as other possibilities of things that uh, Strider could be alluding to. Uh, very, very possibly. Very possibly. Um, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, 
<laughs> Frumius Bujum says this gives a whole new meaning to the phrase graveyard shift. Exactly. Exactly. He was on the graveyard shift that day. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Angrist, I doubt that the Nikerbreakers are what he was referring to, but hey, you know, we don't really know for sure what or would not exactly freeze the heart of uh, Butterbur, right? So uh, uh, who knows? Who knows? Um, uh, Tarlonial says, killer deer. I've met a few in Lotro that, you know, you might want to have to guard against. So um, uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Okay, so now I... I don't mean to restrict houseless hills and sunless woods to like only just draw an equal sign and be like, in that sentence, he's only really talking. He's thinking about the Barrow Downs and he's thinking about Mirkwood. Um, no, I don't think that's necessarily true. But the reason I think that those two things are very, you know, it is. I think it's appropriate for us to be thinking of those. It may, certainly makes a lot of sense for Tolkien to be connecting two dots, right? And the two dots, those the two dots that he's connecting, we have seen, right? Like the story that we have read in the Fellowship of the Ring and the Hobbit, the Fellowship of the Ring so far, and in the Hobbit, have brought us as readers, right, to two dark, very dark places where seriously creep, creepy and evil things live, right? Which are not, by any stretch. Uh, stayed by the strong walls and bright swords of Boromir and his folk, right? Um, so the fact that Aragorn might be alluding to two places that we as readers could immediately connect with and be like, yeah, well, Boromir, whoo, boy, like, you know, peace and freedom, yeah. Um, there's still uh, plenty of issues, right? Um, even if uh, Mordor's armies don't invade. Um yeah, yeah. And Tony says when he says quiet lands, yes, I absolutely think that we should be thinking of the Shire, possibly of Bree, but certainly. What safety would there be in quiet lands? Is Aragorn at least a little bit kind of looking out the corner of his eye at Frodo and Bilbo there? Yes, yes. I think if uh, if houseless hills and sunless woods make us think about the bear, you know, remind us of the Barrow Downs and Mirkwood, um, quiet lands should certainly make us think of the Shire, right? And, oh, I, and I agree, Aronauts, not just the Barrow Downs, not just the Barrow Downs, not just Mirkwood, right? There are many sunless woods and many houseless hills, uh, which the Dunedain uh, patrol. But, uh, um, but again, I think that the fact that he chooses two phrases which will have resonance in our own, like, immediate readerly experience, right? Seems to me not a coincidence. Um, yeah, good. Uh, good, thank you. Uh, Irenaeus says that the Norse archetypes of scary, magical tomb people, uh, that is the the, the Draugr, um, don't stay in their tombs. They have a nasty habit of invading homes. Yes, and that's very much what Tolkien was basing um, certainly that original Barrowite in the Tom Bombadil poem on, absolutely. Um, Okay. Um, yes, good. All right. So, um, the North would have known them little but for us. Fear would have destroyed them. So again, going back to the previous paragraph, hunters always of the servants of the enemy. Well, what do you mean by that? What have you hunted, right? He's not just saying, you know, there are some stray goblins and orcs that have wandered into this region and we've mopped up, right? What he's saying to Boromir is, we're in a totally different category, right? What we deal with is to, it's not like you deal with the mass of the armies, but some stragglers, you know, and, and sort of wanderers get through and we stamp them out. So, you know, we're helping, right? We're contributing. He's saying like, it's, it's totally, it's totally a different project, right? You are holding back the armies of the East. You're a stalwart tower. Good job. Right. But man, there are monsters that live in the rest of Middle Earth. The shadow has crept into all kinds of places, right? And manifests itself in all kinds of ways. Fear would have destroyed the North, but for us. Um, and the very vague dark things, when dark things come, they fly from us. When dark things come, 
they fly from us. We hunt them. We hunt monsters. We hunt the shadow, right? That, that is the heritage of the House of Elendil. Who are we? Who am I? Who is the, what is the broken sword? Why were you sent to seek a broken sword? I'm still answering your question, Boromir, right? Why were you sent to seek a broken sword? Because this is what the broken sword means. The broken sword means being an enemy of the shadow, being an enemy of Mordor, right? Not politically, not militarily even, right? But seeking out the shadow, hunting it down and opposing it wherever it is, and no matter how big and scary and weird it is, right? Um, and yeah, good, Katriana, I love that observation. Uh, he doesn't say... But if dark things come from houseless hills, he says, but when dark things come from houseless hills, because they do, right? Believe me, all the time. You would have no idea how active some of my graveyard shifts are, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. When dark things come, not if. Wonderful observation there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, what roads would any dare to tread? What safety would there be in quiet lands? which I won't name, uh, or in the homes of simple men at night if the Dunedain were asleep or were all gone into the grave. And then the next transition. And yet less thanks have we than you. Travelers scowl at us, and countrymen give us scornful names. Gondor might be forgotten, especially by people far away. Boromir's not wrong to say that the efforts of Gondor to hold the armies of Sauron at bay is unthanked, right? Unappreciated by the people who live far from that frontier which they guard, right? He's not wrong. He's not wrong about that. But Aragorn is pointing out, um, Aragorn is pointing out, we have it worse than you. At least Gondor, when it is known, is respected, right? Less thanks have we than you. Travelers scowl at us, and countrymen give us scornful names. The self-sacrifice that we've been talking about, that we've been associating with the Sword of Elendil from the beginning, um, is deeper than merely the willingness to risk their lives, right? They sacrifice having a home. They sacrifice kingdom and identity. They presumably could have tried to set up a little kingdom in a small way somewhere, right? New Arnor. There's been time. There's been time they could have done that. You know, they could move in somewhere, set up shop, and, and you know, try to build up from scratch. They, But that's not what they want. That's not what they've done, right? Um, they embrace this life, right? They embrace the consequences of the path that they've chosen, right? Um, yes, they die anonymously and far from friends and family, Tony, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, yeah. Um, strider I am to one fat man who lives within a day's march of foes that would freeze his heart or lay his little town in ruin if he were not guarded ceaselessly. Yet we would not have it otherwise. If simple folk are free from care and fear, simple they will be, and we must be secret to keep them so. I think in this whole paragraph, that's the sentence I understand least. Maybe you guys can help me understand uh, that. Why must they be secret to keep them so? What if they, you know, came out of the, like, monster-slaying closet, right? What if they were like, hey, y'all, um, we're here to protect you, right? Um, you know, I'm going to start bringing in, like, you know, the heads of the unquiet dead that I have slain, right, en route to Bree, right? Um, uh, yeah, good. Tessa says because they'll be wiped out if it's easy to find them. Yeah. For Thoughtless says, if you know there's a threat on the border, you're no longer free from care. Yeah, so in order to maximize the freedom 
right, the peace and freedom of these lands, their goal is not just that the people know that they're protected. Their goal is that the people don't even realize they're in danger. That's what they're, that's what they're wanting. That's what they're shooting for, right? Um, and yes, then there's the other issue of, uh, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, Cecilia says that people like Butterbur uh, might be seeing monsters under every rock and around every corner if they knew that they, that you know there were folks on watch and and hunting for the monsters. Yeah, would fear destroy the North anyway, right? Maybe they could physically protect them from monsters, but would they still be destroyed by the... If they're going to protect them not just from the monsters, but from fear, then they need to be secret. Now, I do also acknowledge, as Tessa was suggesting, and as uh, Bricktails was also emphasizing there, if they're open about it, then Mortar is going to come after them full force, right? Yes, I mean, clearly part of the reason why they haven't set up a new... You know, new Arnor up there in the north is that they don't, they want to be secret, right? They don't want to let on. Angmar thinks they won, right? Sauron believes that his endeavors in the north to stamp out the North Kingdom succeeded. He doesn't even know that the heir of Elendil survives, right? If they go open with that information, right? If they claim who they are, um, even if they don't say who they are, they're just like, don't ask any questions. We're just the random guys who protect you from monsters. That's just our job. It's our hobby. We enjoy it. Indulge us, right? If that were their attitude, still, Sauron is no dummy. He's going to figure that out, right? Um, uh, yeah, exactly. We'd get Angmar revisited, right? Exactly. Um, but yet, uh, Melian's pride, I really like that, uh, uh, that point. The North is a psychological battlefront, as the South seems a physical one. Yes, there is a war being waged, not just, you know, individual fights and, and guarding against specific monsters, right? Um, but it is a, a more sort of thoroughly psychological war there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it is true, as uh, Rinrus and uh, Arden Crayon are uh, suggesting, that it is a kind of paternalistic attitude. Um, uh, keeping the Shire and Bree ignorant of their jeopardy. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and Matt, as I think you were suggesting this too, they might not be claiming the kingship, but they're kind of acting um, you know, almost like in loco parentis, right? Um, uh, uh, really, um, for the Shire and for Bree. Yeah. Um, yeah, Brick Tales, exactly. The, the true king has a father, fatherly role. That is exactly what it seems to me, that they um, clearly feel themselves to be like justified in making that call, right? Um, uh, acting like stewards of the North, something like that, Rowan? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um yeah, so I, I think, um, uh, I mean, there, there, there are definitely two sides to it, but my suspicion, exactly as we've just been saying, if you were to look at Aragorn in the face and be like, dude, aren't you being a little paternalistic here? I think he would say, yes, <laughs> yes, I am, right? I think that he might well say, like, the, like these are my people, Right? No, I'm not king. No, I've not been crowned king. But you know what? We, the Dunedain, are going to keep acting like, like as if we were responsible, right? As if we were, in fact, the ones in charge. Oh, I keep forgetting about, sorry. Um, yeah, that they, I don't think they've stopped sort of thinking of themselves that way. It is almost like kingship in, not just in exile, right? In secrecy. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, now Kit says, it is a little odd though, if there's nobody there, but the bad guys are all foiled. Uh, that is if Sauron is quick enough to figure out, uh, how to hunt them down. If they, you know, come out of the closet and announce themselves, 
shouldn't he have noticed a trend by now? Like, all of the monsters that are wandering around all just seemed like it. There seems to be a pretty poor return on investment in the North these days. I wonder if there's some kind of conspiracy, right, against that. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Tony says Sauron may be aware of the Rangers, but not know who they are. It's possible. It's possible. Um, we also don't mu don't know much about sort of communications there. That is to say, yes, there are dark things that wander about in the north and try to bring about destruction. But is there a plan right now? That is, is Sauron coordinating them? Is he like, okay, you know, Barrow White number 46 hasn't reported back for a while. Something happened to him. What's up with that? Right? I had a, you know, I was, I, I keep sending Barrow Whites into Bree and nothing keeps happening. I mean, how hard can it be to conquer this one little village for crying out loud? How many Barrow Whites do I got to send? I, I, I don't think that's the situation, right? Um, exactly, Edith. The monsters aren't necessarily minions of Sauron. They're, they're, you know, I mean, what was that phrase that Aragorn used? Um, servants of the enemy, right? But not necessarily, like, under his direct, you know, deployment, right? Um, yeah, exactly, Marielle. I also doubt that the Barrowites were receiving, were sending monthly reports or receiving quarterly marching orders. Exactly. No. Um, uh, and I don't even know to what extent Sauron would even know how successful things have been. I mean, does he track the area door front, right? Um, I mean, is there like a, a fearometer, right? Like, uh, to what extent is the north gripped by fear because of the monsters that I know to be wandering about? And, um, and you know, and he's going to have like a chart, right? Which is sort of like tracks the rise of the projected rise of fear. And like fear is coming in significantly under projections. We have to like, you know, figure out why this should be. Um, yeah, I, I'd know. I, that's not how things are operating. I think it's pretty clear. Um, Fortala says, actually, that sounds a lot like Sauron. Uh, in some ways, in some ways. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, as Dora Stroke points out, Sauron didn't know of the Shire or of Hobbits, right? Yeah, he didn't even know that the Shire existed, so he's not targeted it. Right. He's not going to be uh, looking at performance reports of like the extent to which the Shire has been terrorized. Um, uh, exactly. Rinru. So you get all these weird little data blips popping up uh, when Gollum starts wandering around. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, right. I, I mean, I, I, I don't think, therefore, that necessarily I don't see any reason to believe that Sauron would have noticed or really be tracking what the rangers in the north have been doing because it's not ever since Angmar. Angmar was a campaign by Sauron, right? Or deputized anyway. Um, he delegated the North Kingdom, right? To the Witch King uh, in Angmar. But but since then, right, exactly, Tony, it's been a thousand years since the fall of Angmar. And since then, there doesn't seem to have been a plan, right? Um, uh, for subjugating the north uh, and, in, and uh, you know, uh, making them enthralled to fear, or, or, or that kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. So, okay. Um, Wes, thanks of within you. Right, okay, we did that. Um, If simple folk are free from care and fear, simple they will be, and we must be secret to keep them so. Um, that has been the task of my kindred, while the years have lengthened and the grass has grown. Um, I love the last phrase, and the grass has grown. It's totally unnecessary, right? I mean, the years have lengthened has established the fact that a lot of time has passed. Why end with the, vis with the, with the, the visual metaphor of the growing of the grass? Right. Um, while the years have lengthened and the grass has grown. Um, 
<laughs> Tessa says, is he showing off that he can do rhetoric as well as Boromir can? It's a different kind of rhetoric, right? But uh, but yes, uh, certainly. Good, mad violinist. It conjures images of nature reclaiming ruins, such as Fornost. And good, Irindus, I was thinking of the same. Um, of the Greenway, right? The grass has grown. Um, the Greenway in particular was a work of old Gondor, of, 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 of the North Kingdom, really. Um grass has grown over and Boromir would have seen it he would have come up the greenway we know he did uh, because he crossed at Tharbad right he was traveling up the greenway from Gondor um, he will have seen um, he will have been surrounded for scores of his 110 days by the evidence of the ancient glory of the full extent of the Gondorian kingdom and then of Arnor ruining, moldering, and being uh, covered over by the grass, right? The years have lengthened, the grass has grown. The glory of Arnor is not just dwindled, it's dead and buried, right? And yet, my kindred has still been at their task. We've still been accomplishing our task. In another way, um, Notice that uh, Boromir bristles at the idea. Like, he seems to take it personally when Elrond is talking about how the, you know, men have diminished, you know, how the, the, the kingdoms of, of the, the elf friends have diminished. Boromir seems to take that personally as if by saying that, you know, Gondor is diminished and the elf friends have diminished, that, um, uh, that like, some aspersion is being cast on the work that they and Gondor are doing. No way, man. Like the, it's pride and dignity are not wholly forgotten. Um, we're still, we're still accomplishing stuff down here in the South. What is How does Aragorn respond to that? He responds to that by saying, yeah, we're accomplishing things in the North too, despite the fact that diminished doesn't even begin to, to, to cover it. Right. The glory of the North is, is gone. Right, and yet we remain, right? And yet my kindred continues to fulfill their task. Um, good, Kimber's also thinking about the peaceful meadows and fields and lawns of the Shire uh, growing up as well. Um, uh, a nicely mown lawn is another thing. You know, remember the only people who had any complaints who will have any complaints in the year 1420 will be those who have to mow the grass, right? Um, so the growing of the grass can also be associated with, uh, uh, with plenty and with blessings, right? And with the, the, uh, the simple life of the simple folk who are free from care and fear. I like that idea. Um, good. Tony is recalling that in Tom Bombadil's vision, of the past that he gives to the hobbits, he also shows grass growing over the ruins as well. So that's, uh, uh, we may well be recalling that image as well from Tom Bombadil. Absolutely. Um, but now the world is changing once again. A new hour comes. Isildur's bane is found. Battle is at hand. The sword shall be reforged. I will come to Minas Tirith. Okay, before we get there, because I have a sinking suspicion we're going to be coming back to that, to those sentences, to this last paragraph next week. Um, these last two paragraphs, these last three paragraphs, what's his message to Boromir? It's possible for this to sound like testosterone one-upsmanship. It could be read that way. You could read it that way if you wanted to, right? You know, be like, well, Boromir, okay, right? You've been a stalwart tower. Well, that's well and good. Let me tell you what we've been up to, right? Um, that this is like competitive with Boromir? You could read it that way, right? And I think some do read it that way. Um, Aragorn kind of responding to Boromir's challenge. Why do we seek a broken sword, right? Um, his look of doubt, right, at Aragorn. Um, uh, but if that's I, I, I think that that's a shallow reading I mean I think it's a possible reading 
But I think it's a shallow reading of these paragraphs. I don't think that's Aragorn's point. I don't think that's why he's doing all this. Um, that he's, that this is a kind of a posturing, right? Um, you know, that he's swelling his chest out and being like, you know, I can, uh, you know, I, I'm bigger than you are, Boromir, right? Um, but if that's not what he's doing, as I don't think it is, what is he doing? What exactly? Why is he saying all these things? Why is he communicating this to Boromir? Why is he giving this picture of the men in the north? Um, interesting. Uh, Chris says, I think it's rather in the spirit of gentle reproof, reminding Boromir that loving the sword for its sharpness is not to the point. He's setting up the notion that all may well contribute to the fight against the enemy, whether they be princes or rangers. Right? Yeah, there's more going on here, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let me... Here's the one thing I would recall. Remember the immediate context. Remember where Aragorn starts, right? Um, for my part, I forgive your doubt. Little do I resemble the figures of Elendil and Isildur as they stand carven in their majesty in the halls of Denethor, right? For my part, I forgive your doubt. He's He starts with saying, Boromir, look, you have just been introduced to this mythic figure, right? You've been raised in Gondor. You, you like literally from your earliest days, right? You would probably have been like, you know, toddling around the halls of Denethor, right? Some of your earliest memories may be of the figures of Elendil and Isildur carving in their majesty in the halls of Denethor. You have been weaned on stories of the old glory of Gondor and of its, of its ancient Numenorean kings, right? Moreover, you're the son of the steward. I know for a fact that you will have been taught about the role of the steward and the duty of the stewards and waiting for the king that shall come. And, you know, that like that we, uh, you know, we stewards but hold the place here. We sit in this little chair down here uh, because only the heirs of Elendil, uh, you know, sit in the big chair up there that's been empty for over a thousand years, right? I know, Boromir, that this has been your life, right? I am sure that when some, if some, when somebody says to you, as Elrond kind of just did, right, I would like to introduce you to the man, the legend, right? Who is the fulfillment of all of these things, right? Elend, the house of Elendil is returning, right? That 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 the ancient stories are coming true. The time that everyone had given up on pretty much, is coming again. I mean, this is... And, and Aragorn begins by saying, dude, like, I know I'm a kind of a letdown, right? Um, you're... Exp I, I don't even know what you could be... Exp but it's it's completely... Um, uh, completely mythic, right? This idea of the House of Elendil and the ancient line of kings... Uh, and everything else, and uh, I don't blame you for looking at me like, what the heck? For real? That guy? The scruffy dude over there? The travel-stained, weather-worn vagabond guy? Hunter? He looks like a hunter from the wilderness, right? Looks like one of those guys who just like lives out in the woods by himself and is like and creeps people out occasionally when he comes into town to buy supplies. Like seriously, that is what I mean. What a letdown, right? Um, and Aragorn says, "Yeah, man, like I get it, right? Let me offer you some context, right? Let me explain why this should be." Let me explain to you how somebody who looks and acts like me, first of all, how this is plausible, right? Okay, you've got Elrond's word for it. And yes, Bilbo, it's totally true that he doesn't need more than the word of Elrond uh, 
to to you know justify that statement, right? Elrond has told him that I'm the king, he should believe it. But he's like, look, I get it. This isn't what the king is supposed to look like, right? If there's going to be one, it's 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 not supposed to be like this, right? So let me explain, Boromir, how this came about, right? Let me let me fill in the blanks for you, because there's a pretty darn big blank, at least between Arvedui, the last king of Arnor, and now, right? If not, Velondil, right? And now, if not Isildur himself, and now, um. Let me let me explain, right? This is why I'm scruffy looking. This is why I look like a vagabond. I am a vagabond, right? The royal line of Elendil has embraced the vagabond life in order to accomplish these goals, in order to remain secret, in order to remain hidden from Sauron, in order to await the day in which we would come emerge out of the shadows again to fight Sauron. And in the meantime, while in the shadows, we've been doing all this good, right? And yes, people scorn us. Now back to that, right? Back to the, and is he boasting? Is he doing some one-upsmanship? I mean, yes, again, you can say that, but again, I think that's not the point. Think again about the context. Boromir is more polite, right? He's a little more refined in his behaviors than Butterbur, right? Um, uh, you can tell that Boromir's been well, been properly brought up, right? Uh, he is not going to call him a scornful name, uh, Aragorn. At least, not yet. The day will come, uh, I believe, when Boromir is going to call Aragorn a scornful name. And when he does, you'll know that things have gone very badly for Boromir. But he will not, he is not yet calling him a scornful name, right? Um... Notice, therefore, what Aragorn has established here. He's established a contrast, right? He says to Boromir sort of two things, right? Thing number one, there are good reasons why the long-lost mythic king return should look like I look, right? Should have the background that I have, should be living the life that I have lived, right? There are good reasons for this. We have embraced this. And what's more, we are doing important work through this. The North Kingdom and the South Kingdom are still complementing each other. We are still united in the fight against Sauron, Boromir, right? But in very different ways, right? But also, there's a gentle, uh, not rebuke, but invitation, right? He's not criticizing Boromir because Boromir's not being guilty of calling him scornful names. But should Boromir be tempted, because I agree, Lady Shmebuak, he's totally thinking the scornful name. Right? He might not have actually called anyone scruffy looking yet, but he's thinking about it, right? Possibly even speculating about whether or not he does or does not herd nerfs, but he's thinking it, right? And so what does Aragorn do? He paints him a little picture. Yeah, you know what, Boromir? There are people. I'm not mentioning any names, right? Well, I'll give one example, right? One fat man, but um, there are some people. Boromir, who look at us, and they are so shallow as to think that we are, you know, shameful bag vagabonds who come wandering in from the wilderness, right? There are a lot of people, you know, simple folk who don't really understand, who aren't really clued in, Boromir, who don't really see the big picture. There are folks, believe it or not, there are folks like that who don't really see the big picture, who don't get it, Boromir, right? Um, and those people... Those clueless people over there, right? The simple people, they call me scornful names, right? They treat the rangers as if we were nothing, as if we were garbage, right? But of course, Boromir, needless to say, I know you're not like that, right? I know that, you know, again, he's not, he doesn't say this part explicitly, but there seems to be a kind of implicit invitation there, right? Like, Boromir, you and I, can have an understanding. We understand how simple people would act like that, right? But fortunately, Boromir, right, there are no simple people here, right? You're not one of those people. You're not going to lump yourself in with Butterbur, right? Because I know you weren't tempted to do that, Boromir, right? Um, yeah. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yes, exactly. Zach Payne says, Brutus is an honorable man, and those men call me scornful names. Yeah, it's a similar kind of rhetorical technique. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 that seems to me part of the message here to Boromir, right? Like, basically, like, you pride yourself on being clued in. You pride yourself for your connection to the to the distinguished heritage and 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 the the, the great tradition of Minas Tirith, right? Somebody in that tradition would see through the surface, right? Um, so I'm going to first explain to you. I'm going to explain to you why you see what you see. I'm going to explain to you the surface and how this surface does in fact match what we're telling you, what Elrond has told you, lies beneath it. Right? I'm going to help that make sense to you, right? And then explain that we're not doing it. It's not shameful. It's the opposite of shameful, right? We have embraced this for good reasons, right? Um, we have, in fact, been your silent partners in this whole defending the West from darkness for a long time, right? And then I'm just going to invite you to distance yourself from those simple folk whom we guard ceaselessly uh, and care for paternally, right? Um, but who don't acknowledge or value what we do, right? Um, that seems to me one of the other things that's going on here. So next time, let's talk about these sentences of Aragorn's here at the end. We're, we're going to do the field trip now, um, but we'll begin next week, and we will have class next week. I'm not leaving, as I was originally thinking I, I might, even as relatively recently I was thinking I might, but I won't be. Um, so I'll be around next week, so we'll, we'll, do, we'll do class next week. Um, but uh, we'll start our class with a discussion of that last paragraph, of, the, of the, the rhetorical conclusion to Aragorn's big speech here in the council. Um, and I want to think about these different... Sent these are calculated sentences, right? Short, hard-hitting sentences with this deliberate uh, syntactical transition, right? That has been the task of my kindred while the years have lengthened and the grass has grown. But now the world is changing again. As he rhetorically pivots around that but at the beginning of that paragraph, what is he declaring? This is the end. This is the final message to Boromir, right? This is the culmination of the message he's delivering to Boromir. What are the things he is saying here? What is the final message he's delivering? What does he have to say to Gondor in general, the council as a whole? Because again, this is Aragorn's biggest speech all day long and to Boromir personally. That's So we'll do that next time. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining me for class tonight. We're going to shift over to the field trip, which I am hopeful will happen, as still I am crash-free uh, to this point. So I'm going to shift over to Twitch. So I'm going to say goodnight um, to the folks on the town and to the folks on Twitter. Uh, feel free to join us, twitch.tv slash signumu. Uh, so we'll see you guys over there. See, I know you guys keep telling me not to jinx it but I'm doing it on purpose. I defy <laughs> the crash, you see. Because I figure purpose. if I do that often enough and it doesn't happen, then I'm, I'm good, right? <laughs> okay. All right, so we're going to continue. We're going to, we're going to, we decided that uh, I'm really tired of taking a slow horse to Angmar and then riding across Angmar before we can begin the field trip. So, um, we're going to quick travel to Gathforthnir and resume up there. So I'm going to, so this is a little tip. If any of you can't quick travel to Gathforthnir, go now. I'll give you a little head start. Um, uh, and here's what giving you a head start is going to look like. I'm going to look at the map uh, to do a little review of where we're going in Angmar. So, okay, so we're up in Angmar here. Okay, so we've been field tripping primarily here in the western part of Angmar, and then uh -huh. through the southern part of Angmar. We were just down here in uh, Gab Gabil Shathur, the dwarf encampment, last time. Um, yep. And 
we were gonna. I was thinking of heading out from there, continuing along that line, and going off down here to uh, to 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 Mythod and Gorothlad, this area down here in the southeastern corner uh, of Angmar. Um, but for the sake of ease of travel, I think we're going to head straight up here to Gathforthnir, uh, which is way up in the far northern reaches of Angmar, disconnected from everything else that we've already... We did get as far uh, before we abandoned Angmar a long time ago. Um, uh, that is when we crossed the Ford of Bruin. And uh, we, uh, we were up here in, the, in central Angmar in Imlad Balkorth and stuff. And we'll get back there and finish our explorations there. Um... But so we're going to kind of jump to Gathforth near again, primarily just for ease of travel, because uh, it's going to make things much simpler uh, for right. us to do that. So we're going to jump up to Gathforth near. We'll explore Gathforth near tonight. Maybe start to look around Himbar a bit. We may be occupied by Gathforth near. We'll see. Um, and then we'll we'll continue spreading out from here. We'll go around Himbar down. I'm going to wait. I'm still going to wait and save Urogarth and Karn Doom. We're not going to go too far uh, uh, west up there in, in you know in, in in northern Angmar. We'll save Karn Doom until the end. Um, but um, uh, but anyway, yeah. So we'll um, we'll explore around here. We'll do Barad Guluran, uh, which is in this same area. Uh, we'll come back down and go do uh, Imlad Balkorth and uh, the Mythad and Gorothlad down there that we were planning on. We'll get down there eventually, head out towards the rift and see what we can see out there, and then we'll come back to Karndoom. So that's the new plan for where we're going. So All let's right. go. Let's head out to Gathforth near. Awesome, awesome. Because, yeah, we don't want to have to spend like 10 minutes of every field trip time just traveling by slow horse every week for the next several months. <laughs> That'll get old. So I was, th I was thinking, you know, you're talking about how the Rangers of the North took uh, Oath of Secrecy or something to everything, and it's like, uh, oh, that explains why they always send me to do everything. <laughs> right, exactly. I want you to blow their cover. That's it. It's yeah. Just, yeah no. it's, it's just about the secrecy. Yeah. Wow. They must be seen you know, to keep saying, it so. So there's nothing that says secrecy like sitting by a campfire. You know, that's a great way to yeah. keep a low profile. You um, didn't protect the North at all. I killed those trolls. Did I? <laughs> didn't I? Well, they, they just I? like, look, if you delegate, then you still get credit for protecting the North. You know, <laughs> like it's, it's, you're still part of the overall what project management you? of the protection of the North. Uh huh. Yeah, it makes perfect sense yeah. to me. So I'm still I'm headed up to Estaldeen, and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna, uh, go from there. Okay. It's it, their 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 modus operandi seems to be if you've done some done everything right, no one can be sure you've done anything at all. Exactly. Right. I mean, and that's secret, right? I mean, that is preserving the secrecy of the Dunedain right there. If they never even leave their fireside then nobody can trace the good deeds back to them. Yeah. Perfect secrecy. That's what that is. Perfect, Perfect secrecy. secrecy. Yeah. I think I think it's a brilliant plan. A really Greetings. Good oh, yeah. All right. Headed up to Gathforth near, which I can't really go to because I don't have the rep, but that's okay. I'm going to mithril coin there. But I think it's also important that he's setting up Boromir for the tone of the rest of this. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't know that they're going to be going on a secret mission, but he is telling Boromir right now, this is not going to be fun. This is not going to be glorious. Right. right. And, no yeah. one, and if anyone notices you, it's going to be for all the wrong reasons. Exactly. Yeah. And and the um, the oh, man, I love the cliffs here. It's so <laughs> imposing and like appropriately gloomy. <laughs> um but um but anyway yeah no I absolutely agree uh what um, do you need that the I mean in some ways it kind of connects back to what he was saying um what Boromir was saying about seeking Elrond's help right like that he's you know he said like I you know I've not come looking for you know strength of arms right he's not he's not coming hoping for military allies that he can go back mm -hmm. to the south with. Um, and Aragorn's reassurance there has been kind of two-sided, right? On the one hand, he's like, we are helping, right? Like, we do help. Yeah. You know, I I can, in fact, you, assist you. 
in that way. You weren't looking for an army, but hey, we got one. <laughs> right. We, in, of, of a sort, yeah. We, we, we kind of yeah. do have one. You do have a military partner in the north. It just doesn't operate in the way that you were expecting, right? In the way that you think. You ain't never had a friend like Exactly. Something like that. Um, but you're also right that he is signaling to him let me let me kind of tell you how this is going to play out from here, right? This is not, mm-hmm. um, we're not going to be, I don't know, blowing horns and charging at any point, mm-hmm. right? That's not, uh, that's, that's, that kind of action is sort of counterindicated here. Um, uh, it is certainly true that they're going to be playing Aragorn's kind of game, right, for some time here, rather than before they get back around to uh, Boromir's type of conflict, which, of course, eventually will happen, but... Yep. Oh, good thing you're already experienced camper for me. Right, exactly. A journey of 110 days, very good. Let's um, um, uh, let's see that. And by the way, I really do like the way in which later on in the text, um, Boromir, um, when he's responding to Celeborn, um, when he and he talks mm-hmm. about the strange paths that you know that their party has traveled. Right. Um, I really like. I like how Boromir seems even by that time, by the time they get to Lorien, even he is kind of contextualizing the fact that like, okay, that whole like journey of 110 days that I was bragging about before in retrospect now looks kind of tame, right? Um, You know, and the journey we've had since Rivendell really kind of has broadened my horizons even more than my original journey did, right? Yeah, and I thought the Eisen Fork was annoying. Yeah, exactly, exactly. (laughs) Okay, um, cool. Hang on. So let me let me look over the edge of this cliff here. Uh, first of all, I, I love the guy who pitched his tent over here. <laughs> right, and laid out his bedroll. Yeah. Right on the edge of the cliff. I mean, first of all, Here's this rock, rock looks just flat less comfortable than the dirt up there. So, you know, this guy is clearly like, or this lady, I should say. She is one tough cookie, right? Uh, Who obviously doesn't get up in the middle of the night for any reason. Right, apparently not. Flora Thistledown. She has a, 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 a well, very botanical name. Is she from Brie? Sounds like it. She's a jewelry trader. Yeah. Wow. She really yeah, is. Yeah, another botanical name for sure. Yeah. Very botanical name. Um, and sorry not to get in your personal space, lady, but I'm just looking at your clothes. Um, the 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 kind of um, like botanical thing. Like she's got like the leafy business, like up on the top of her. Like it's a green tunic, uh, but it's not quite elvish. But it it kind of reminds me of some of the uh, uh, some kind of the the decorations that we can see in in elvish tops as well. Kind of Mirkwoodish, yeah. A little bit, yeah. Um. But yeah, boy, she's. Um, she would have had to hammer her stent, take tent stakes into the rock for this yeah. tent to work. Yeah. I, so I think she's I got like something to, think, to prove. I like to think that she is somebody that she. So I like to think that she chose this camping spot because she just likes it. She's like, I like a camping spot with a view, right? And I'm not afraid of the precipices. And I prefer hard obsidian to, like, barren turf and dirt up there. Um, Maybe it's a watchman's position, though. Maybe the, she's tag uh, the, teaming. Because this is the defensible sniper position, maybe. Right. No, it's way too far. No, it's way yeah. too far. Wait. Yeah, you could, you could drop a rock down, and hope you yeah, hit him. Exactly, but, yeah, exactly. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, you couldn't exactly Catch shoot from up here. But, um, yeah, well, anyway, but the other thing, though, I mean, of course, there is a darker possibility, right? And that is that, like, she wasn't allowed in. Uh, so she's having to squat here because, like, she's being discriminated against. Um, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't like to think that that's just. I, I I'd like to think that she chose this because she's just that tough and and. Uh, uh, she likes a firm mattress. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Sort of enjoys yeah. the view here. Um, Under the fell dome. Yeah. Um, and there's a tower 
That's Baragularan, right? over here. Yeah. Notice the sky's different colors on different parts of the dome. A greenish over there. Yeah, right. so it's like, this is tea with a little milk on it. Right. And the water, is that like a sulfurous kind of green? It does look like the sulfurous sort of alkaline. Right, like what we, we saw, saw in before, but... Yeah. Uh-huh, it's even got that white sort of crust around the outside. Kind of, you could kind of imagine that's something salt or something like the water is completely useless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no scum or anything on it either. Yeah, yeah. There's no evidence of growth. It's not, as you say, it's not. It's not scum, which is which, which is biological life, right? Um, mm -hmm. It just seems to. It just looks like green water, really. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It is fortunate, Emma Thorne, that video games don't include smell. I am not sure I <laughs> would look forward to that innovation. <laughs> if at some, if I'd never want to do anything for a ranger again. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I uh, yeah, I'm not sure that's a piece of realism I would enjoy. Yeah. Meanwhile, we've got these two chatty guys who are just. You know. Mm -hmm. Ferenkel clearly looks like one of the rangers of the north. Um, right, right. Is this guy also a ranger? He doesn't seem... He's dressed in browns and blues, unlike most of the ones we've seen in Estel. He's wearing studded pants. Studded pants? Yeah, he's got studded pants. Sir, what do you do that requires studded pants? I know. Is it for traction when he's rolling uphill? Could Maybe be. Maybe less said the better. <laughs> Maybe the less said the better, yeah. I mean, some people like different things. Some people are into <laughs> studded pants. Well, I mean, so it looks like armor, basically, is what I'm saying, though. Uh, more than, I mean, even his mm -hmm. his top there seems more... Are, I mean, uh, yeah. Fearingal is, is just in clothes, rooms. yeah. Um, he's in traveling clothes. The mm -hmm. other guy is is armored. Um, not to mention armed. He's got this big old quiver. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe he was just at Karnjum or one of these other places around. Yeah, Karita, I agree. What he does with those studded pants in his free time is his own business. <laughs> and I'm not even going to ask, but so I was just looking at the design on, like the the sort of the the, the wavy design. I, I from the front I couldn't tell if there was an actual like serpent figure on the quiver, but I don't think there is. Hmm. No, but it's a design for sure. A Torodon's dressed similarly. This this fellow behind you in the green cape, he's got oh, also more the, studded pants, the armored yeah. pauldron, okay. and his 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 jacquard is is um, also studded as well, and his gloves. So this is all over. Yeah, so maybe this is maybe it's more a matter of those two are armed for combat, whereas this other dude, Fearingal, is uh, this is Ranger Casual. That's Ranger Formal, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, they're clearly both Rangers. Um, yes. Uh, I say clearly uh, because they have matching hoods, so that makes it clear. Mm. Right? Um, yeah. And the face mask uh, is good, right? This guy is... Uh, he's set, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, not, in fact, practicing social distancing, but he's... <laughs> Nevertheless, oh man, at least wearing a mask. Um, and this guy's actually on lookout, which is handy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just made him turn around. That was my bad. I wanted to see what he was wearing. Will you oh, lend yeah. me your ear? Yeah. Hey, man. Not interested in your quest. Just looking at your clothing. Yeah, yeah. He does have the same pattern of armor up there along the top. The same hood. Love the Dunedain hood, by the way. I mean, I think that that 
you know, whole hooded oh, yeah. cloak with the with the lining, you know, the two tone thing. I, I I I think it's a great look. Yeah, I dig it. I dig it. This guy has knee patches on his padded on his uh, studded pants. Obviously, you don't want studs on your knees. That would hurt. Yeah, no, that's no good at all. You like taking buck shot to it. <laughs> yeah, Zach says nothing shouts. I'm part of a secret organization like matching uniforms. It's true, but you see, <laughs> notice that their hoods are all different colors, Zach. So no one will pick up on the trend, right? Yeah, uh, you just the, have to remember what instrument they play. Exactly, right. Another that would be a giveaway too. Um, if they actually formed the band like the dwarves, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're not color cause, and because but notice how much more complicated their color coding is than the dwarves, right? Um, you know, they've got the two-tone rather than the one-tone hoods, so... Oh, I noticed Brunier over here is sporting the same armor here. Wait, which one? Our little, our little fellow, or one of one of our Mythgard guys, Brunier. Oh, right. You want to step forward, red and green? All right, yeah, there we go. Oh, there we are, there. yeah. Look at that. Yeah, you've hey, got Here's the nice the Dunedain hood. Set. So so where is that, where, where's that armor from? Yeah, oh, he's even I got think... the studded pants. Look at that. Yeah. You can examine them and see. Inspect. There we go. Inspect. Do you mind, Brutier? I'm sorry to be intrusive here. <laughs> yeah. Give us a 12, love. Okay. Wait, I've forgotten how to inspect people. Uh, I can't switch these out. Oh, there it is. Uh, outfit number two. And that is Jacket of the Impossible Shot. Oh. That doesn't give us much to go by. Oh, oh no, that's me. I'm looking at my thing. That's Woodland's Ra sorry, Woodland Ranger's Tunic. I was reading the wrong one. Okay, so just, right. It's just Woodland oh, Ranger's Tunic. So this is official. Woodland Thank Ranger's you, Tunic. Yeah. Is this one of the things that you get in uh, Volume 3 with the, the, the Grey Company? Um, I don't remember. I I get the feeling this is the one you yeah the one yeah. you get in. All right, so these are the Woodland Rangers shoulder wrap. That is what they call. That's a, uh, that's the name of this fashion line. The 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 mm -hmm. armor up at top. Oh, it's a Wildemore. Why do I want to say ended with? Oh, Wildemore. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Yep. There okay. we go. Wow. All right. We got the fine gray company boots, right? And the hood, what's, done, what's, what's the done. hood, right? Woodland Rangers hood, right? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Totally the makes sense. Set. I love the fact that underneath his wooded Woodland Rangers hood, he's secretly equipping a plumed hat, right? I, I think that's a lovely combination, you know, like secrecy, you know, solemnity, but like flair underneath. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's just the way to do it, Brunier. Excellent. Yes. Okay. All right. I like, let's... I like the red accents. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. I agree. Oh, and of course, our stable master looking similar. Oh, no, also red he's green. got like a one tone gray hood. Now that he's really need to, needs to upgrade his hood. Maybe it's a sign of rank. Yeah. Maybe he's still just a stable oh, yeah. master because he's not earned his hood yet. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He's got more Alan Adele looking with his red. Yeah, he is. Much more. <laughs> okay, so I really like the secret door thing that we're doing here, except we're lining it with a... I mean, we've got this path that comes up, right? And then you can't see the door until you get up to it. Like, you're in arrow range by the time you get to uh, uh, the door. Uh, in sight yeah. of the door. But, of course, you're in sight of the torches lining the path up there before you get there. And why are we... Sure. Why do we have supplies outside the door? And lumber. What's the lumber for? Box O lumber. Box O. I mean, I guess the guards could use supplies, and they have a tent. What, in case they need to take a nap on the job? Mailbox. That seems odd. <laughs> um, a mailbox, sure. Well, I mean, that goes without saying. I mean, it, it implies there's not enough room inside for everything. Right. Exactly. Right. Is it just like his? Yeah. They. 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 they I mean, they. Is this the Rangers of Gothnir in need of a storage pod or? You know, they got to re... Are they hoarders? Wouldn't surprise well, me. Well, also the inside is a cave and there's water in it. Maybe everything in there needs to stay dry. 
Hey, is the implication that this, like, hawk here carries the mail? Yes. Are there hawks That's... standing next to all mailboxes, and I've just never noticed it? Many of them, yeah. Really? It depends on where you are. I've literally never noticed that. <laughs> Actually, in fact, never noticed the hawk standing next to the mailbox. But that makes perfect sense. <laughs> wow. Okay. Huh. Amazing. Makes more sense than a pony. Well, yes, it certainly does. Um, all right, let's... Let's head into the secret hideout. Secret tunnel. Secret tunnel. Oh, man. Okay. All right. We come into the secret tunnel, and the first thing we notice is pretty spacious. I could squeeze in some extra boxes in here, gotta say. And we've got barrels or basins? Like catching drips. Yeah, I, I mean, that would be a good way to get fresh water if the water is undrinkable. Right. It is Angmar, and we got that green water down, down the hill there. Uh, okay. We've got more... I'm just looking at people's names here. So she's an elf. You can tell by, I could tell by her armor before I even noticed her ears. Um, she's wearing exactly the same livery that we saw the elves by the last bridge wearing. Uh-huh. Uh, she, this armor trader, seems to be Dunedon woman? Um, sh I'm not sure. Sh her robe looks similar to the stuff we see in Kalanda. Yeah. Is she an elf? And the name, can't suggests, see her, the name suggests she is. Can't see her ears. I mean, of course, the, the rangers are all, all have elvish names as well. That's true. Well, I think you can see it on this side. Oh, what, her ears? Um, uh, yes, elf. What? Ah, elf. There you go. Yeah. Okay, that's Kalanda. why she's hanging I, I out with the Kalanda. other elf. So we've got the two armor traders. Hanging out with the dwarf, who is the light yeah. armor trader. And the giant pig. And the giant They're pig. They're eating well. Yeah. You've got, what, like a bowl of nuts and a pig carcass? I, I always think that looks like a, I always think that looks like a bar, barbecue pork. Yeah, absolutely. On that plate. Absolutely. <laughs> Dime was asking if it's a haggis. No, no, it's an actual pig. It's an actual no, pig. You can, yeah, you can it's still got see little the limbs sticking out. And the tail. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. The tail's the crunchy bit. Yeah. Yeah. That actual actual pig. Um uh, okay. Where it came from. <laughs> Alright. So two elves and a dwarf. Uh-huh. Interesting. Walk into a bar. In your secret hideout. Uh -huh. There's apparently a substantial amount of international traffic. Here. Now, see, now, who's this lady? She's human, yeah? Puriel, yes. Puriel. Right, she's human. Dunedain. Right. Yep. Her... She's wearing sort of utilitarian clothes, like sneaking around in the wilderness ranger clothes. No right. hood. Let's hope nope. that's not gender discrimination in the distribution of awesome two-tone hoods. Seriously. I can't imagine that that little hairnet she's wearing around her bun is any kind of equivalent to a two-tone hood. I at least would not be satisfied with that in exchange for one of those snazzy hoods. But she's better okay. off than Mr. You know, Wolvest over here. Lunathron. Whose outfit really just screams peasant? Street rat. Street rat. He's got <laughs> bandages on his feet. Bandages on his face? On his feet? Feet. I think it looks. Oh, like doesn't he's that got mean have boots? Yeah. This guy didn't even get boots. Wow. Okay. So this guy. I think it's less discrimination, more 
More supplies. Maybe base? all the crates out front. Maybe all the crates out front are empty. Oh right, that they've turfed the empty crates because they've already. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's true that all the barrels in here are empty. Looks like all the Amazon boxes piled out in front of my dumpster. <laughs> right, right. Very. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, all of them are empty in here. Yeah. Got nothing but empty boxes, and that's why there would be a pile of wood, because that yeah. was like a broken box, right? The, the, the recycling guy hasn't come yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, the recycling guy hasn't come. So they've got evidence of lack of supplies, a dwarf complaining about working with elves and men. Uh huh. That uh, owl is a pet, right? Uh, yes. That owl is not native? Okay. No. Didn't think so. More dwarves. So where are the dwarves coming from? Maybe the dwarf encampment we found. Uh, right, from down in the south. Yeah. I guess um, so. I mean, they must from... be. So they're traders. Published. Right? Uh-huh. Yeah. It must be from Duckville. Ah, here we go. Scenic waterfall and Scenic stairs to nowhere. Waterfall and stairs descending into the shallow end of the swimming pool here. Um, all the way down to the bottom. It implies yeah. this was flooded. Exactly. Yeah, it looks like there was a cave in down there. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where that used to go to. Hmm. Where have we seen structures that look like these stairs? I can only think Goblin Town. Well, it's not quite rough enough for Goblin Town. Yeah, you're right. It's too sturdy looking. Oh, yeah. um, some of the barrows had steps that look like this. Perhaps. Um, ah, Pontine says the um, you can get cosmetics to look like the peasant uh, that we passed by over there, and it's called the Dunedon yeah. Workman's Outfit. A workman's Outfit. Workman's Outfit. That's what they call their peasants, apparently. Um, they get paid in shoes. <laughs> right. Well... Yeah, not well, apparently, but... Uh, well, that uh, might be a loafer. Yeah. Oh, loafer. Oh, that was not intended. <laughs> now, who are you calling a loafer? He's a workman. Um, <laughs> okay, look at that wall behind there. This is the first evidence we've seen of construction. I mean, other than the oh, stairs, yeah. right? We've got oh, a brick yeah. wall. Oh, that looks familiar. Which is like a ruin... Is it an Arnorian ruin? Yeah, it looks a lot like the Arnor stuff we saw in Farnham. Sure does. Similar color? Not like we've seen in any anywhere else in Angmar that I recall. Yeah, this looks like this was an Arnorian fortress, though why they built this wall here, I don't know. It hmm. Looks like the wall was kind of eaten by cave formations. So. Yeah. Not a healthy place to build. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the sequence here. Yeah. Does this suggest that? I mean, so I take it that this suggests that this wall was built as an interior wall. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't imagine that the inside of this cave has changed that much. That the wall has like surrounded and eaten up the wall like a fungus. So That would take like a thousand years or something. That would take a long, long time. Like a million years. But yeah. So yeah, I, I have to imagine, therefore, that this wall was constructed as part of the cave itself. Which Just means... Just like a bulwark? Yeah, or like to shore up. I mean, if there was some reason why they needed to um, I, I, if there was some, I mean, there were there are arrow slits, right? So there was something back there. I don't know what. I mean, there's windows, small windows. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, that seems to be a deliberate window, but it's also rough. So I think it was a deliberate window that is worn away and widened over time. But, um, but yeah, so either they wanted this wall, either this wall was a partition that they constructed inside the cave, or it was built to shore up this wall for some reason because they felt that it needed shoring up. Um, I'm not quite sure Possible. which. But it does look like an Arnorian wall. I don't recall bricks like this, you know, stones, cut stones, like of this kind being used anywhere else in Angmar. It doesn't seem to be either Angmarim or um, Hillman, you know, sort of native pre Angmarim Hillman culture. These steps I could believe to be that, but not the wall. Yeah. Not the wall. Um, unless, again, I'd, well, I'll keep my eyes out. If I see something like that elsewhere, maybe I'd be proven wrong. Um, but... We should take a closer look at Karn Doom to see what we can... Yeah, exactly. So look at the arches built into this. We've got a vaulted ceiling now. So again, showing how there has been deliberate stone masonry used to support and... Um, you know, sort of round out the uh, structure of this cave. It looks old, too. Yeah. That arch looks like it's almost done. Yes. But I think the stone blocks that we can still see attached to it, yes, are of a similar kind to the wall out there. Mm-hmm. Though I do agree that in general, this wall certainly looks like it's in worse shape than the one that we saw out there. The wall with the door in it, I mean. Though not the door itself. Oh, yeah, yeah. The door itself yeah, is the in... Yeah, the door... Looks... In fact, this whole square area, right? Both the door and the doorway, like the arch of the doorway and the brownish, you know, the sort of darker brown stone around yeah, it looks like it's stone, new. Yeah, the red stone, yeah. Maybe that's why the doors are here. Right. Maybe this was recently installed since they took this ruin and made it into their... Uh, um, you know, made it into their top secret hideout in a ruin here it's a beautiful romanesque arch it is once again once again proving that the dwarves can't do anything without putting their embellishments on right Remember we saw that last time right right exactly i can't just make a door yeah where was that was it a prison cell it was like a prison cell but it was like decorated right yes it. yes yep yep okay Hmm. Okay, so clear evidence of earlier, much earlier inhabit inhabitation, uh, inha yes. Habitation. In ha habitation, that's the word I'm looking for. Much earlier habitation of this cave. Um, but I don't think just by dwarves. This does not look like native dwarvish architecture. No. So I don't think that's what we're looking at here. Too many round, too, too many round arches, for one thing. Yeah. Not enough angles. Yeah, Certainly to not. be to be Longbeardian. Yeah, it's not Art Deco enough. Exactly. exactly. This, um, some bits of it remind me a bit of the fortress in the Trollshaws, the, the abandoned one we saw just at the edge of Aregion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, could it be Elvish construction? Boy, that would be challenging to imagine. That is what the elves were doing up here. I mean, they were around, and they would have predated Angmar, obviously, as they predated almost everybody, but um, I don't see Let's much see. to make me think it was necessarily elvish. Let's go inside here, and we probably should let people go. It's getting late, but... I could garden. That's what it was. I could garden. The right. strange little elvish fortune. Okay, another is... matching door inside a bigger uh -huh. wall. Okay, and then here is Lorniel. An erect wall. Yeah. And an old arch. Like the larger arches that were out in the hallway. Mm -hmm. These stones are definitely like the one in that first wall that we saw. More yes. empty barrels and boxes. And 
little little Breland bookcases. Yeah. Okay, so she's That's what she... I'd haul all pair all the way from Bree. Books and bookcases. Book yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, they probably constructed the bookcases out of some of the empty crates. <laughs> right? They I did mean... a beautiful job with the hinges. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, those they probably imported. The hinges they probably, you know, imported from uh -huh. dwarves. But the, the... The books Lornia lugged up here, I can totally believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Me coming back from England with an extra suitcase. Right. What is that book? I don't know. It's got an illustration in it. I know. I, I feel like I should almost be able to recognize it. Looks like trees or something. Yeah, it is a tree. Trees and branches. And it's like Tom Bombadil sitting by the river. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it's the tree. Maybe. What, like Nichols tree? Huh? <laughs> maybe. It does look a lot like an English um, engraving illustration. It does. Yes. It really looks like a, like an early 20th century yeah, English book. Of, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely an engraving. Yes. Some hilly hut with hilly countryside behind it. Maybe it's the party tree. But <laughs> we're supposed to recall the party tree anyway, perhaps. Maybe. Yeah. That it, it does look very much like a very big tree in an English countryside. Hmm. hmm. That's a fun could, little Easter egg. <laughs> could this have been an Arnorian construction? Could this? Could they have? This is why they built their, their, you know, their stuff here, their 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 camp here, because mm -hmm. they had some kind of legend of an old Arnorian stronghold up here, which would have, I mean, before the rise of Angmar, you know, yeah. before the Witch King came up here, they might well have had a fortress. But why would they have had a cave fortress like up way up here as an outpost to keep watch? On what, the hillman? Not sure. Yeah, I don't remember enough of the uh, in-game history of this region to... Yeah, exactly, Amethorn. It would have to have been before the Witch King arrived and took over the region, which is totally plausible and certainly would match what looks like some pretty old ruins in here. Yeah. All right. Well, it is getting late. Maybe we have some time to just look very quickly at the other two branches. We've seen most of the cave, mm -hmm. but... Sorry about that. I cut out there a bit. <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem. I say let's... Uh, I was saying... I yeah, let's I just said see. I think the answer to this is going to be in Karn Doom. Yeah, quite likely. Quite likely. What a riddle. Oh, see, that, that arch broke in half. Then. Some of my kin believe that Goladir... What? What do you say, dude? I believe that shadow will soon lift. So who is this guy? Danith? I think he's um, one of the... Ar no, we're Arvid That's what they're um, one of the hillmen. Yeah. He defected or didn't want to join. Or something? Right, one of their one of the allies from the south. Yeah. I can't see his dialogue because I already taken his quest. So. Oh, there's yeah, there's the days are Artane over here. Too. He definitely okay. looks like it sickens me to know yeah. that my people are threatened by the evil ones, and there's not I can do. Okay, um, yeah, he's just not even going to talk about what he's doing here, apparently. Okay. 
Uh, and then you've got this guy, yeah. Artine. Now, what is... What are you? I mean... He kind of looks like one of the Hillmen also, but... Um, A little different. His hair is lighter than his face. Yeah, and his armor is nothing like theirs. Right, the Trave uh, Duvardine. Edith, thank you. That was the right. name you. I was not remembering. Um, yeah. Is this guy one of them, too? I mean, he does not look I like think one so. of the Duvardine. He does look like... So. No, he looks like the people at O'Hare. Right. O'Hare. Okay. Okay. Tree. Okay, right. So I'm not going to be able to go in and see Goladir, right? Mm -hmm. Right, Goladir's not here for me because I'm not in that phase. Why am I experiencing oh, yeah. dread, however? Uh, because um, her um, despair at her father being uh, taken by the forces of the Karndoom. Going to lead her to do some unpleasant things. All oh, right, it's an area dorm map, or it's a larger map. It's a Middle Earth map. Mm. Okay. Oh right. yeah. Tree again. Look, there's a corner. <laughs> an actual corner. We haven't seen a corner. We've just seen walls ending in native, natural stone walls. And bookcases. Yeah, this Two actually implies there was an end of the structure. Yeah, exactly. This is a this is a, a legitimate room, not a cave. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I keep thinking I'm going to look up and see a little patch of sunlight there, or starlight, or something to indicate what this place would have been. But right. Okay. Well, I think so the place we have. From and the place we haven't been is down to the south, right? Yeah, we didn't yep. go this way. Yep. All right, another similar branch. Mm -hmm. Yep. With a similar pig on a similar table. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, this guy explicitly referring to his cousins in Gabo Shathur, thus confirming where these yeah, dwarves came from. Hey, corner. Another corner. Look at that. Yeah. More bookcases. They like their books here. That's I gotta good. say, this is this is definitely one of the more uh, uh, scholarly hideouts of vagabonds I've ever seen. They didn't have this many books at Estel. Right, it's Lyrodin's it's like, room, yeah. It's the secret book, Mogan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I'm... Now we know it wasn't all the boxes. Right, books. It was all books, <laughs> right? As you said, Delicious it was Amazon books. packages, so that was it. They, <laughs> they, had, they had their library delivered. They ordered, they ordered online after they got here. Yep. And, and you know, once it is, once you're that close to shipping, you might as well get more. <laughs> That's right. Right, exactly. They bought their books in bulk. Uh, it all makes it all makes perfect sense. Okay, well, I can't imagine what the history, ancient history, that is, of this cave must have been, other than it could well have been an ancient outpost. We have all these internal walls to make, like, you know, defensible points in case the enemy came in, though you'd think additional exits might have come in handy in that case. Uh, well, that but, might be what went down the ramp and to the water that got blocked off. Perhaps, perhaps. But I mean, yeah, once you've you've got like multiple walls with multiple gateways here in each place, right? In each branch. Um, yeah. But once you've shut yourself in here, you're not getting out. So uh, uh, that yeah. seems a little bit. Eggs in one basket. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
it is possible, Aostara, that there was massive damage done to the mountainside and, and the caves have kind of collapsed around the walls. Um, but see, but a lot of this, a lot of it is built, I mean, like these arches, like look at these arches right here, right? Like that was built into the walls. I don't think that this is, like the natural rock was part of the construction. This one's gone over here, but, um, uh -huh. you know, and this is a little wall built just to bridge this gap. So there's this natural passage in the cave, but they've built this artificial choke point to make these inner places defensible is what it looks Defensible. like. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, again, you'd need an escape route from in yeah. there, or else you're just delaying your own demise, right, by barricading yeah. yourselves in down there. Um, but... Uh, yeah. Again, cementing the theory that, that there was an exit and it's underwater now. Right, right. Yeah, but no, I mean, you would have needed separate exits from each one of the extremes, I would think. Oh, in order for oh, the defenses yeah. to make much sense. But um, but they might have had that. I mean, again, there has been... The walls are some in ruin, are, are ruined. And as Druid's Fire was just pointing out, there is space behind the walls. They're not just built in... Um, they're not just uh, cosmetic, the walls. So maybe they had a secret passage leading out. I like to believe that. And then, yes, this could have led to another exit which has since flooded out since this river was diverted in here. Okay. But who built it? And why? Whose highly fortified hidey hole was this in the ancient days? But it would make sense if it were Arnor because if there were somebody they wanted to keep an eye on up here, they, their power didn't really extend here. They wouldn't have just built a fortress on a hill. Um, because that would have been to invite attack, or even it would have appeared aggressive, right? But if they wanted a secret uh, outpost from which to observe Northern Angmar just as assiduously as this elf over here is observing the waterfall, then um, it would make sense for them to do it this way, to have a yep. well-constructed... Uh, Bolt secret hole base. here, yeah, secret yeah. base, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Katrina, I agree with you. The pool would have to be draining out somewhere down below, um, pretty rapidly, or else the whole cave would flood in short order with the volume of water that's coming in from the waterfall. Yes, an equal volume must be pouring out at the bottom, which certainly supports the idea that there used to be an exit down there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps even a fairly prominent exit that is now maybe that's what the a waterfall. pond maybe that's what the pond at the bottom the was pond at the bottom yeah possibly so we'll have yeah. to see if we can see uh, the uh, the egress of the water outside um, yeah yeah cool all right well thank you for joining me in my exploration of Gathforth near and we will uh, we will resume. We will head out and look around uh, uh, Himbar up here, and um, uh, then we will head down towards Barad Gularan, I think, once we finish exploring up here in Himbar, in the immediate vicinity of uh, Gathforthnir. Then we will head on back south. All right. Very okay. good. Thanks, everybody, for joining me, and I will see everybody next week. Bye. Bye, everybody. Oh, so, uh, sorry, I'd forgotten to say, before I go, just quick. Um, so we decided, especially since we're in a hard to, we're exploring some hard to reach areas, um, which I know are harder for uh, when we're visiting some of the servers where fewer people have primary alts. Um, we're just going to, our plan right now is we're just going to kind of stick to Landreval, which is the home base of many of us. Um, we're, that doesn't mean we're never going to visit any other servers, and we're happy to do that if people, like if there's a kinship or something who would like to invite us to come uh, to another server, um, we can totally do that. We're still open to doing that. But we just, for now, especially while we're in Angmar, um, we're going to kind of stick to Landreval for a while uh, out of convenience. Um, but again, we can certainly make an exception if, uh, uh, if there is a call for it. So, all right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Oh, happy birthday, Dragon Rider 22. Yes, and happy birthday to you.
to the others who. Oh are... yeah, that's why I knew it was Dragon Rider's birthday. Yeah, birthday. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Very good. Oh, that's right. Uh, it is right now. As I forgot, it's after yeah, midnight here on midnight. the here on the on the East Coast. So yes, happy birthday to you. Aw, oh, thanks. Very good. All right. See okay, everyone good next night. week. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.